Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Annabelle loved walking in the forest. It felt particularly easy and refreshing to breathe here. The girl grew up in the nearby village and knew these places like the back of her hand. Every path was familiar to her. Yet, her boyfriend Vince always worried and complained upon hearing about her latest trip. Where do you know who might be waiting for you in this forest, he asked. Who could you meet there? For example, with whom? Annabelle asked, although she knew the answer perfectly well. Vince started to get agitated. Anyone. Some alcoholic or drug addict. A wanderer with a shack out there. Oh, what wanderers, the girl laughed. The only wanderer in the whole area is Uncle Vasya, the alcoholic from the farm. He's the one you can meet anywhere. There are no bandits in our forest. Trust me. Our village is too far from the city for them to come here. So don't worry. I'll stay safe and sound. I'd like to believe that, Vince said. Because you know who will find your lifeless body if something happens. Annabelle almost fell laughing. Vince. I love your sense of humor. Although it's quite dark, she said. Well, if you say so, Vince said. Because I'm not laughing, and I wasn't joking. I'm dead serious. You should stop these walks. They won't lead to anything good. However, Annabelle brushed aside all of Vince's repeated speeches and concerns. She attributed it to the fact that he wasn't from the village. He moved to their village a year ago, right after finishing medical school. He worked as a paramedic, replacing Mr. Roger, who held that position for 30 years. And he remained a very serious person. He saw danger and hidden motives in everything. In his opinion, the forest was inhabited by dark individuals. There was unsanitary conditions and bacteria on the farm. Vince even considered the neighbor's dog, Cooper, a breeding ground for fleas, and deep down, he didn't like it. It seemed strange that such a meticulous person became a doctor. Annabelle accepted his quirks, but she acted on her own. Deep down, she hoped that over time, Vince would get used to village life and start walking with her. But he always found excuses. You know, I hope to get a higher education, he said. It requires a lot of studying. Why do we need this forest? When there's barely enough time to read a book. That was the plain truth. Despite living in the village rather than the city, Vince had plenty of patience. Elderly people with high blood pressure, children with scraped knees, and sometimes even unlucky individuals with poisoning constantly besieged his office. Every evening after work, Vince dedicated himself to reading meticulously, while Annabelle, having finished her job at the post office, went to the garden or the forest. And on this evening, she went to the edge of the forest to pick strawberries, completely unaware of what she would discover there instead of berries. At first, Annabelle indeed gathered berries, mechanically stooping down, collecting them in a bucket. However, soon this activity bored her, and she ventured deeper into the forest, lost in her thoughts, unaware of her surroundings. Annabelle wasn't afraid of getting lost and walked on, not knowing where she was heading. Her legs chose the path themselves. As always in such moments, she contemplated her future and Vince's future, wondering if they could have a shared one. Sometimes it seemed to Annabelle that she was in love with him, while other times she felt that Vince was just a friend. A good one. Maybe even better than anyone else. But not the person she would choose to spend her life with. And she had no idea how to sort out these feelings. Somewhere in the distance, the sound of a car caught her attention, bringing Annabelle back to reality. The girl froze and listened in surprise. The main road was quite a distance from this place. Here, there was only a dirt road, and besides the gamekeeper, no one used it. Who would need to drive out into the middle of nowhere at night? After hesitating for a couple of moments, she headed towards the road. Annabelle had no doubt that she would only meet the gamekeeper, Uncle Henry, whom she had known since childhood, and yet she tiptoed and approached with caution. Her sixth sense told her to be careful. This is all Vince's doing, the girl angrily thought. 
Who else could be wandering in our forest? It's so remote. Even forest spirits don't come here. Why am I afraid? The sound of a running engine grew closer, and Annabelle froze. She wasn't well-versed in cars, but this quiet hum didn't resemble Uncle Henry's iron horse off-roader. An involuntary shiver ran through Annabelle. Maybe Vince was right? Maybe I shouldn't get involved in this, she wondered. However, the road was just a stone's throw away, and the unsolved mystery enticed her like a magnet. I won't be able to sleep tonight. I'll keep thinking, the girl said to herself. What happened here? I'll just take a quick look. No one will notice. Annabelle was indeed confident that the driver wouldn't hear her. She had been walking in the forest since early childhood, and her late grandfather, a gamekeeper, had taught her how to track animals. To move so silently that she could spot a cautious doe, a majestic moose, or even a wary hare. Not for hunting, of course. But to admire the beauty of the wild. Annabelle couldn't stand senseless killings. This world was too beautiful to intentionally harm it. Carefully sneaking up to the road, the girl peeked out from behind the trees. Through the bushes, she noticed the gleaming side of a car, and her last doubts vanished. The gamekeeper hadn't bothered to repaint his car since the day he bought it, and here, in front of her, stood a luxurious vehicle. Somewhere nearby, a male voice could be heard, and Annabelle almost started running. The owner of the voice was out of sight, hiding on the other side of the car, and seemed very, very agitated. Wendy. This wasn't part of the plan, he said. I'm not saying I'm innocent, but not murder. He lowered his voice. I didn't sign up for murder. Annabelle covered her mouth with her hand to stifle a scream. Murder? It seemed that Vince was right when he warned her about reckless walks in the forest. This wouldn't end well. Just a few seconds later, the girl realized that the conversation wasn't about her, and her life wasn't in danger when the stranger on the road mentioned a name. Howard is still alive, but maybe. He paused. All right, understood. The conversation ceased. Apparently, for good. However, the man on the path continued to be nervous. He cursed under his breath, lit a cigarette, and started pacing back and forth on the trail. Annabelle caught glimpses of his tousled blonde hair through the bushes and struggled to suppress a sneeze. She couldn't stand the smell of tobacco smoke, and now this peculiar trait could work against her. For some reason, Annabelle had no doubt that the stranger wouldn't hesitate with her. He would forget about everything and kill her on the spot to eliminate any evidence. The forest was rapidly growing dark. The man finished smoking, opened the door at the back seat, and started pulling something out from there. Judging by the sound, it was heavy, as the stranger kept panting and muttering something to himself. A heavy bull, Annabelle heard. Curse you. The girl couldn't see anything behind the massive car. Meanwhile, the man, still moving away from her, dragged his burden into the thicket on the other side of the road. Annabelle heard the crunch of breaking branches and secretly rejoiced that the man didn't come in her direction. Hiding in those bushes would be difficult even for her. And for her, the granddaughter of a gamekeeper, a confrontation would be inevitable. The noise grew fainter. It became quieter, and the girl started to get nervous, contemplating her next move. Maybe she should run back to the village and call the police? But she had gone many kilometers away from the nearest inhabited house. It would take too much time. And who would go with her? The only law enforcer, Justin, had long relaxed in the village wilderness. He had grown a beer belly and was simply not trained to catch criminals. At best, he would beat up alcoholics on the farm. Right away, the conversation was about murder. The girl shifted from foot to foot, unable to stand still. Somewhere nearby, someone needed help, and she stood there unable to do anything. Maybe she could hit the blonde stranger with her bucket, but thinking about it was ridiculous. All she could do was wait to see what would happen next. Soon, footsteps were heard again. The stranger was returning. He continued grumbling, but this time there was a tone of relief in his voice. It seemed that he had accomplished his task and was incredibly pleased with it. 
The stranger took out his phone again, made a call, and reported to his partner. Yes. Wendy, everything's fine. Fine. I'm telling you, Howard's dead. Don't worry about anything. Get the champagne ready. I'll be with you in a couple of hours. Annabelle continued to stand, motionless, until the car disappeared in the distance. The scene she had become a witness to had a profound impact on her. She was still afraid to make a sound, even when the rumbling of the car had completely subsided and was replaced by the usual sounds of the forest. Only a few minutes later, Annabelle snapped out of her daze and forced herself to step out from behind the tree. She needed to act quickly. Annabelle stepped onto the road and hesitantly looked in the direction where the stranger had taken something incomprehensible. She couldn't find the courage to utter the word, body. According to the scoundrel's words from the expensive car, it was impossible to help the unfortunate person who had been taken into the bushes. And yet, Annabelle couldn't do anything about it. Maybe the killer made a mistake, the girl thought. I have to make sure of everything. Truth be told, Annabelle couldn't imagine how she would examine a dead body. She decided to think about it later, once she reached it. First, she had to find the body. Annabelle crossed the road and ventured deeper into the bushes, searching for the right path among the broken branches. A couple of times, she took the wrong turn and had to backtrack to find the correct path. The villain had carried the body quite far, and Annabelle was ready to accept the inevitable and return to the village when she noticed something red behind a fallen log. The girl involuntarily screamed, thinking it was blood. But then she breathed a sigh of relief. The discovery turned out to be just the sleeve of a red sweater. And there was its owner. Looking at him proved to be more difficult. Annabelle slowly circled the log and fearfully looked at the body. The man lying on the ground was dressed in a sweater and jeans, wearing sneakers. It all seemed of good quality, but incredibly dirty. Apparently, the killer dragged the body along the ground. It was impossible to make out the face of the victim. A plastic bag covered his head. The body remained still. And so did Annabelle. The idea of checking for a pulse on the body seemed ridiculous and terrifying to her. She would never dare to do it. Not for anything. She needed to call Vince here. But then, unexpectedly, the girl heard a strange sound, as if an injured animal was moaning. But there were no animals nearby. Only this unfortunate person who had become a victim of a terrible crime. Annabelle looked at the man skeptically. At one point, she thought she saw his finger twitch. Then again. Without hesitation for another second, she ran up to him and removed the plastic bag from his head. The stranger was alive. There was no doubt about it. Only now did Annabelle notice the rise and fall of his chest. The clumsy killer hadn't been able to finish what he started. He hadn't dared to soil his hands with the crime, leaving it for another time. There was no doubt that without Annabelle's help, the stranger wouldn't have lasted long. Without access to oxygen and with the injuries he had, he wouldn't have survived for long. The man was indeed badly beaten. His face was bruised, and he had a terrible wound on his head. Tears welled up in Annabelle's eyes at the sight of the bruises. She couldn't bring herself to touch the stranger, fearing that she might cause him more pain with an inadvertent movement. Unable to come up with a better idea, Annabelle called out to the man, Hey! Can you hear me? Of course, he couldn't hear her. The man was in such a deep unconsciousness that Annabelle's voice probably wouldn't reach him. It would be useless to scream. Besides, she was afraid of drawing attention to herself. Annabelle felt as if the killer hadn't gone far yet. He would hear her scream from miles away and come back to finish his job. Only this time, he would kill them both. He wouldn't hesitate to use plastic bags to complete his task. Annabelle looked at the man again and whispered softly, I'll definitely come back with help. Just wait for us, please. Once upon a time, in school, Annabelle had participated in an obstacle race. The track they ran on seemed challenging to the students, full of bumps and pits. Now she realized that the race had been a walk in the park. The real hurdles began when Annabelle raced through the bushes, trying to find the shortest route to the village. 
They weren't bumps and pits anymore, they were real ravines, logs, and bushes snagging her hair and clothes. At one point, she fell. But she quickly got back on her feet, ignoring the pain in her knee. What did it matter? There was someone dying in the depths of the forest. He was in even more pain than she was. Annabelle sprinted to Vince's house in complete darkness, with only a few sporadic streetlights illuminating the way. The door was locked, and she began banging on it like a madwoman. Vince. Open up. To Annabelle, it felt like an eternity before Vince reached the door. When he finally opened it, his eyes widened in surprise. Annabelle. What's happened to you, he exclaimed. What happened? I went into the woods, she replied, struggling to catch her breath. I know that. Vince interrupted. I warned you not to do it. I asked you not to. What happened to you? You're only coming back now, in the dark? Annabelle. You're so foolish. Did someone hurt you? Tell me. Where does it hurt? All these questions made Annabelle dizzy. However, the genuine concern in Vince's voice touched her to the core. I did meet a scoundrel in the woods, Annabelle said. More than that, a murderer. Oh, my God, Vince. I saw someone being almost killed right before my eyes. Vince's face expressed shock. Annabelle took his hand. Calm down, Vince. Everything is fine with me. I'm unharmed. And when I left, that person was still alive. That's why I came to you. You must come with me and save him. Why me? asked Vince, still recovering from the shock. Annabelle looked at him in surprise. Because you're the only doctor in the whole village, except for the veterinarian. Who else should help the injured? Reluctantly, Vince nodded. You're probably right. Wait here. I'll check my bag. I'll make sure I have everything I need. Meanwhile, explain to me in detail what horror you saw there. Right now, all I understand is that someone almost killed someone else. You miraculously escaped, but I need the specifics to decide what exactly I should bring. While Vince irritably rummaged through his medical bag, Annabelle recounted the whole story to him. She told him how she went towards the sound of a car, observed the strange man, and listened to his equally strange conversation. You're completely crazy, Vince said. Annabelle. Do you even realize what could have happened to you? If he had noticed you, no one would have ever found you. Who in their right mind would venture into such thickets? Annabelle didn't feel guilty at all. She nodded obediently to avoid angering Vince. That man is badly beaten, she said, waiting for a pause in their conversation. He might even have some fractures. Seriously? Vince said. Maybe we shouldn't meddle in this and call an ambulance instead. What if he's already dead? Let them declare the death. Vince. Don't even say things like that. Annabelle exclaimed. He's alive. I'm sure of it. And how do you know? Vince sighed, closing his medical bag. Let's go. Oh, by the way. We need to grab a flashlight. It's nighttime. Vince's old SUV pulled out of the garage. Vince remained silent, and Annabelle kept quiet, afraid to irritate him with careless words. I told you not to seek adventure, Vince finally said. But no. You didn't listen to me. If only we had gone into the woods together. Nothing like this would have happened. But you don't like going there. Annabelle remarked. You prefer your books. Vince looked at her grimly. So, we shouldn't have gone anywhere at all, Vince said. You went to the woods every evening, as if there wasn't enough air here. We don't live in concrete jungles, do we? It's ridiculous to go out into nature. Annabelle sighed sadly. A year of living in the village hadn't changed Vince one bit. He remained as detached from the land as he was at the beginning. She vividly remembered the hysterics of their first meeting and didn't know whether to laugh or cry about it. It happened at the end of last summer when Annabelle came to the club with her friend, Goldie. 
Goldie immediately disappeared into the crowd, searching for adventures. She was always the more spirited one in their duo. Annabelle wandered around the hall for a while, looking for familiar faces and exchanging greetings. It was then that she noticed Vince in the crowd. Apparently, he didn't belong to the company either, as he didn't even attempt to ask anyone to dance. He leaned against the wall, observing the people with the air of a naturalist scientist. It was as if he had already diagnosed each one of us in advance. Annabelle laughed when she told her friend about her first impression of him. Vince had such a focused expression on his face. You could immediately tell he was a real doctor. At the time, Annabelle knew little about the visiting medical assistant. She mostly heard gossip from the old ladies, mentioning that he was very young, barely over 20, and had come to the village as part of some government program. They said he dreamt of becoming a doctor in the future. The neighbors somehow knew all of that. Deep down, Annabelle felt sorry for him. She thought he probably missed the city and his family. She herself missed her grandmother immensely while studying at college. That's why she decided to cheer him up with a smile. Good evening, she politely greeted him. His title, doctor, put him on an unattainable pedestal. Addressing him casually with a simple hello wouldn't be appropriate. Vince gave her a scrutinizing doctor's look and nodded curtly. Annabelle felt embarrassed and walked away. Idiot, she scolded herself. Why did she bother a stranger? It was obvious he didn't need it. Now it was just awkward. Fortunately, she didn't dwell on these thoughts for long. First, Annabelle chatted with her acquaintances. Then she exchanged a few words with Josie, the bakery worker. She completely forgot about her encounter with the young medical assistant until someone called out to her. Hey. Maybe we can dance? Annabelle looked around. An enormous boy, two meters tall, approached her. He was huge, but with such a pure, naive gaze that only a child could have. Hello, Carl, the girl nodded. No, sorry, I don't feel like it. As expected, the boy didn't understand at first. Oh, why not, he asked. Did someone invite you? No, Carl, Annabelle politely replied. I just don't want to dance. I'm tired from work. Let's do it another time. The girl slowly retreated from the persistent admirer, and her escape was almost successful. But a third party intervened. She already said she won't dance with you, a male voice spoke. Don't you understand? The new medical assistant, who had been attentively observing the crowd, approached their pair. Annabelle didn't know what diagnosis he made of her suitor's face, but she knew in advance how it would end and tried to calm her protector. Please, don't worry, she said to the medical assistant. We're fine. Carl is leaving. Why would I suddenly leave, the enormous boy protested. I didn't even consider it. It's better if this brat leaves instead. He's meddling in things that don't concern him. The medical assistant's temperament turned out to be no better. Vince also got fired up like a match from those words. What did you call me, he asked, displeased. Oh, what? Didn't you hear, the enormous boy asked cheerfully. Seems like you're deaf. People like you shouldn't mess with me. Got it? You're only fit for a hospital. Is that what you wanted as well? I'm my own hospital, the medical assistant replied and wasted no time on empty talk, throwing the first punch. Annabelle, frightened, recoiled to the side. Dancing couples scattered. Someone screamed. Vince and Carl fought in the center of the hall. But no one even thought about breaking them up. Unlike the young medical assistant, everyone had long realized that joking around with Carl was a bad idea. Annabelle tugged on the sleeve of her classmate Clyde. Stop them. What are you just watching? The guy looked at her in surprise. Oh, why should I be the one? They'll figure it out themselves. The doctor will end up on the floor, and that'll be the end of it. Wanna bet? And so it happened. Carl wasn't a professional boxer. He didn't engage in any sports. But he had height and strength on his side. 
It didn't take a minute before Vince lay flat on the floor, showing no signs of life. For a few moments, an overwhelming silence filled the hall, and then someone hysterically shouted. Call a doctor. There he is. He's lying on the floor, a girl replied, and many burst into laughter. Annabelle wasn't amused at all. After all, this whole mess had happened because of her. She ran up to the medical assistant and gently patted his cheek. How are you, she asked, worried. Are you all right? To her relief, the guy finally opened his eyes. I'm fine, he hoarsely replied. I'll survive. This couple left the hall amidst the excited whispers of the crowd. Vince walked on his own, but Annabelle still supported him, fearing that the medical assistant would collapse at any moment. When they stepped outside, Annabelle inquired, are you sure you'll make it home on your own? Your house is far away, almost at the other end of the village. Aren't you feeling dizzy? Or maybe something hurts? The guy laughed at first, but immediately interrupted his laughter and winced in pain. Usually, I'm the one asking such questions, he explained. I couldn't have imagined that one day I would find myself in the role of a patient. You're not the first, Annabelle reassured him. Anyone who gets involved with Carl ends up like this. The locals have known about it for a long time and avoid getting involved with him. But you're new. You're not aware of our affairs yet. Well, actually, I wanted to help you, the medical assistant remarked. Wasn't that necessary? Annabelle became flustered. Thank you. I'm very grateful that you didn't stay on the sidelines. But maybe you shouldn't have intervened. I've known Carl for a long time. We went to school together. He's just a harmless guy. He never hurt any girls. Not in school, not now. Harmless, huh, the guy mumbled. I noticed. I'm sorry, said Annabelle. It's all because of me. The medical assistant brushed off her words and asked, by the way, how do you know where I live? Am I some kind of local celebrity? Of course. Annabelle replied, surprised. Didn't you know? Since you arrived in our area, the whole village has been talking about you. Feels like I ended up in a reality show, Vince groaned. How can anyone live like this? Seriously. I thought those same old ladies were running around after me three times a week. Gathering gossip, I guess. Don't be so upset, Annabelle comforted him. Soon everyone will get used to you. And you'll become a part of the village. The medical assistant nodded with a resigned look. Just need to wait for about six months or so, he mumbled. It's no big deal, really. Neither Vince nor Annabelle could have imagined that even after a year, the guy still wouldn't be able to fit in and become one of them in the village. The new medical assistant differed too much from the local residents, and no matter how much he wanted to blend into their community, it was impossible. The guy decided to change the subject of the conversation. By the way. Why do you always address me formally, he asked. As far as I can tell, we're almost the same age. You're a doctor, the girl replied. I mean, sorry. You. I just can't address you like any other classmate or old acquaintance. Besides, we're not even acquainted yet. Vince, the guy introduced himself. Although you probably already know my name. I'm the star here. Annabelle, she replied, struggling to hide a smile. Nice to meet you. That evening, Annabelle had no idea where their acquaintance would lead. The medical assistant seemed pleasant and a bit peculiar, nothing more. After the memorable night at the club, she didn't see Vince for a long time and completely forgot about him. Until one day, her friend Goldie confessed. You know, I really like Vince. He's such a sweetheart. Annabelle looked at her in surprise. Who's Vince? Our medical assistant. Goldie rolled her eyes. Did you forget about him? Everyone keeps talking about this Vince. I did forget, Annabelle replied. With all the work and the garden, I'm completely exhausted. I never thought I'd say something like that. But I wish Autumn would come sooner. Garden, garden, Goldie mocked her. 
there's this handsome guy walking around, and you're burying yourself in your garden and can't see the light of day. No, Annabelle, your grandmother is a real tyrant. Annabelle pondered with surprise. On the day she accompanied Vince home, it never occurred to her to scrutinize him. Annabelle was more concerned about getting Vince home safely than his appearance. Besides, love fantasies hardly bothered Annabelle. She was preparing for the college academic year, flipping through her notes to refresh her memory of forgotten knowledge. How can I establish contact with him? Goldie mused dreamily. Go to the disco. Invite him to a slow dance, Annabelle suggested. You're brave enough for that. It's easier for you. Goldie thought for a moment and nodded. Good idea. That's what I'll do. You have to take the bull by the horns. Don't wait for someone else to do it. This applies to guys too, Annabelle. So don't miss your chance while you're buried in books. No one interests me, Annabelle absentmindedly said. So, there's no one to seize. Good luck to you, Goldie. Let me know how things turn out between you and Vince. However, Goldie had nothing to report. At least, not that evening. After their first rather unsuccessful visit to the club, Vince rarely appeared there and hardly ever danced. It seemed like he was there out of boredom. Goldie failed to win over the medical assistant. But unexpectedly, Annabelle herself ended up going to him for an appointment. It happened completely unexpectedly during her usual evening work in the garden. She tripped and injured her arm. Not just a minor injury, but a long, bleeding cut. Mrs. Flores, her grandmother, clutched her heart and ordered her to immediately see a doctor. But Grandma! Annabelle protested. Where am I supposed to go? It's already dark. The medical center has been closed for a while. Let's just bandage the wound and wait until morning. It's just a regular cut. There's nothing serious about it. No. There is. Mrs. Flores objected. And it's not a regular cut. I think stitches are necessary. The word terrified the girl and she began to protest even more vehemently. But not for long. Under her grandmother's watchful eye, Annabelle obediently went to the medical center. As expected, it was closed. Now what? Annabelle asked. I told you that this whole idea of seeing a doctor is pointless. Let's go to his house, Mrs. Flores decisively said. His house, the girl exclaimed anxiously. Grandma, that's going too far. People rest at home. They try to forget about work. And here we are with our problems. Vince is probably already asleep. He took the Hippocratic Oath, her grandmother retorted. That means he should treat his patients at any time. Don't argue with me, Annabelle. We're going to the medical assistant's house. Annabelle was burning with embarrassment as she accompanied her grandmother to Vince's house. The lights were on in his windows. Relief washed over her. They wouldn't have to wake him up. Mrs. Flores rapped on the door with authority. Footsteps could be heard behind it. Who's there? Vince asked warily. Patience, Mrs. Flores sternly replied. Her granddaughter hurriedly added, Vince. It's Annabelle from the club. Please open the door for us. Vince appeared at the doorstep. He was wearing a regular t-shirt and sports pants. The television was talking in the background. Vince didn't resemble a doctor in the slightest. No wonder Mrs. Flores frowned. Good evening, the medical assistant greeted them. What happened to you? I fell in the garden and cut my hand, Annabelle said, extending her palm to him. Please take a look. Vince looked down and furrowed his brow. Mrs. Flores asked purposefully, does she need stitches? Vince nodded. Fear coursed through Annabelle's body. Even the pain took a back seat. Is it necessary? She weakly asked. Vince shook his head. The medical assistant looked at the frightened expression on the girl's face, and his gaze softened. It won't hurt much, Vince reassured Annabelle. I'll give you anesthesia. Come inside. He ushered the women into his house. 
Mrs. Flores settled herself in a corner of the room to not interfere with the doctor's work, while Vince fetched a suitcase with all the necessary supplies. It won't take much time, right? Annabelle anxiously asked. It won't, Vince promised. And don't even think about crying. Look at this rabbit. It's covered in stitches everywhere you can imagine. Yet it's smiling. Take inspiration from it. He handed the girl a plush rabbit that was indeed stitched up all over, as if the toy had a difficult life. What happened to it? Annabelle asked with pity, looking at the rabbit. These are all my young patients, the medical assistant replied. I gave them this rabbit as a helper during injections and other unpleasant procedures. And they held onto it too tightly. As a result, I had to treat both the children and the rabbit. It turns out my job is stitching everyone up. Poor thing, Annabelle said, petting the rabbit's head. He's our little hero, it seems. Definitely. Vince confirmed. And you be a heroine too. All right, Annabelle? Don't faint or tear the rabbit apart. Especially the first one. Your grandmother will never forgive me for that. The young couple turned and looked at Mrs. Flores. The stern expression on her face made it clear that someone who hurt her granddaughter wouldn't fare well. Vince administered the injection, and Annabelle winced, turning her head away. It won't hurt anymore, the young man promised. The word of a doctor. Nevertheless, Annabelle continued to grip the rabbit tightly, like a drowning person clinging to a life buoy. Vince tried to distract her with conversation. By the way, I still don't know what you do, he said. Maybe you could tell me? Do you work? Are you studying? Are you really interested in that, the girl blushed. Or are you just afraid that I'll lose consciousness? And that's why you want me to think about something else. Both, Vince replied. And I'm afraid sitting in complete silence is just silly. Besides, it's unfair. The whole village is watching me, spreading rumors. Yet I haven't properly gotten to know anyone since I've been here. Annabelle shrugged. I don't have much to tell, to be honest. I'm studying at a pedagogical college. During summer vacation, I substitute for Mrs. Russell, our mail carrier. She has a garden, livestock. And she's getting old. The poor woman can't keep up with everything. So, you'll be a teacher? Vince asked. The girl nodded. Yes, for elementary grades. I've always loved children, but I never had a brother or sister. On the contrary, I have a big family, Vince replied. That's why I escaped to the village. It became too crowded for all of us in one apartment. Renting a place in the city is expensive. For the first time, Annabelle realized that she had never even thought about whether the young medical assistant had any relatives or not. She had no one except Mrs. Flores. Her mother died when Annabelle was five years old, and she didn't even know her father. The girl had never imagined what it would be like to have a complete family. Where would you like to go if you had the opportunity? Vince unexpectedly asked. If you could choose any place on the map? Annabelle was at a loss. It embarrassed her to admit it. But she had never traveled anywhere outside of the city. That's why the whole map is just a dark forest to me, Annabelle said. Sure, I study geography in school. I've seen photographs. Watched some educational films. But it's all like a movie to me. Too fantastical, as if someone will actually go somewhere. And it definitely won't be me. I would go to Africa, Vince said with a smile. I've dreamed about it since childhood. All those jungles, national parks. I want to become a true specialist and escape somewhere. I'd love to see the world. Annabelle looked at him with admiration and involuntary respect. Such confidence in his abilities was beyond Annabelle's reach. That's why she dreamt of seemingly small things like a teaching position and a strong family. Maybe even the sea, which she had only seen in pictures. And that's it, Vince said, finishing bandaging her hand. Now come to me every morning for a checkup. Annabelle looked in surprise at the pristine white bandage. So fast? 
Time flies during a conversation, the medical assistant winked at her. That's why I always talk to my patients. It's like an extra dose of anesthesia. Understand? Thank you, Annabelle said. So, until tomorrow? She stood up and headed towards the door. But at the last moment, she remembered the rabbit she was still gripping in her hand and returned to Vince. Thank you, she repeated. With this assistant, it wasn't as scary as I thought. Vince waved his hand. Keep it. This hero deserves retirement. You can see for yourself. Besides, he can chase away bad dreams too. You never know when you might need that. On the way home, Mrs. Flores bombarded her granddaughter with questions. Did her hand hurt? Was the medical assistant careful during the procedure? In general, she asked a bunch of questions that seemed unnecessary and meaningless to Annabelle. Her mind was occupied with something else entirely. Did Vince talk to everyone the same way he talked to her? He had said that he did, but he gave her the rabbit alone. Well, what kind of gift was it anyway? Annabelle was touched by it, but there was definitely nothing romantic about the gesture. And her friend believed that only a bouquet of roses or a golden ring could be considered romantic. Not an old stitched up rabbit. And yet, she didn't tell Goldie about it, not knowing why. Everything fell into place on its own, at a moment when Annabelle was completely unprepared for it. You're still going for checkups with the medical assistant? Goldie asked one evening, about a week after Annabelle had her stitches. The girl nodded. Yes. Vince said I need to come to him for another week. He wants to observe how the wound heals. Another week? Goldie said. As if you'll leave him alone after that. Annabelle looked at her in surprise, thinking she must have misheard. What? she asked. What do you mean, Goldie? And what do you think? Goldie replied. And you call yourself my friend. I knew you liked him and yet still flirted with him. I thought I could trust you. And you? What kind of flirting? Annabelle continued to be perplexed. Do you think I intentionally cut my hand so that I would need stitches? Like anyone in their right mind would do that? How could you even think such a thing, Goldie? And what was I supposed to think? Goldie answered her question with a question. You two see each other every day. He gives you gifts. I think it's pretty obvious. Just say that you're officially a couple and I'll leave you alone. At least that would be honest. What gifts are you talking about? Annabelle continued to be bewildered. What are you saying? Vince has never given me anything. Goldie pointed at the bed. And what's that? You know, I was at Vince's house once. I tried to ask him for a health certificate. But also to get to know him. I saw this rabbit at his house. Is he already giving you toys? Is it the candy bouquet phase? Annabelle didn't know whether to cry or laugh. She completely forgot about the rabbit and didn't even think of hiding it. Over the past week, she had gotten so used to the toy that she hardly paid any attention to it. Every night, the rabbit was by her side, like a pillow or a blanket. It's just an old, worn-out toy, Annabelle said to her friend. What courting? Have you gone mad? If it's just a toy, let's throw it in the trash, Goldie suggested. It's not a gift from a lover anyway. Why do you need it? Annabelle hesitated. She looked at the sad, worn-out face of the rabbit. Goldie's suggestion seemed like sacrilege to her. I won't throw it away. Annabelle replied to her friend. That would be disrespectful to Vince, and it's just not right. Fine then. You love him. Goldie concluded. I thought you were my friend but you're worse than an enemy. A traitor. She stood up and headed towards the door. Annabelle tried to stop her, but Goldie yelled. Don't touch me. You're nobody to me now. Go kiss your medical assistant. There must be a reason why you disappear into his office every day. The argument with her friend caused Annabelle a lot of pain. 
During her school years, she was not very sociable and rather introverted. One could say that Goldie was her only friend. While the other classmates may not have bullied Annabelle, they didn't particularly stand out among others. Ending a long-standing friendship was very difficult. Annabelle's mood didn't improve, and a couple of days later, Vince asked about it. Is something wrong with you? Lately, you don't seem like yourself. Maybe your hand hurts? Annabelle shook her head. No, everything is fine. Well, not entirely, but my hand doesn't hurt. It's more about my soul. Do you want to share? Vince asked. But you're not a psychologist, the girl quickly said. So, no, probably not. Besides, my problem isn't that big. I'm just overthinking everything. It's all a lie from start to finish. Annabelle was deeply upset about the rift with her friend, and she was certain that the pain from it would remain with her for the rest of her life. But confessing this to Vince and explaining the reason behind her fight with Goldie? No, it was simply impossible. So, there won't be any confessions? Vince asked. Okay, but let's still try therapy. How about going to the movies with me tomorrow? They're showing a comedy. It'll help you forget about all the problems. A comedy? Annabelle was surprised. Is there some movie showing in the club this weekend? I haven't heard anything about it. Not at the club, her boyfriend corrected her. In town. I'm planning to take some things to my relatives in the city. My mother loves village sour cream. It'll only take about 15 minutes. After that, we can go to the movies. What do you say? Annabelle looked at him in astonishment. The offer was so unexpected. Perhaps, thinking about Goldie's feelings, she should have declined the offer, and yet she wanted to answer, yes. Over the past few days, Annabelle had become exhausted. Without her friend's company, she felt lonely. Besides, the invitation to go to the movies seemed harmless, almost friendly. As if understanding her doubts, Vince said. Just a comedy, nothing more. Please, don't make that face, Annabelle. Going to the movies is not the same as going to the marriage registrar's office. The girl blushed and nodded. Okay. Let's go. We just need to be back before it gets dark, otherwise, my grandmother will start worrying. She's always afraid of accidents and incidents. Just the movie, Vince assured her. Then straight back home. Vince kept his word. They simply went to the movies, and he didn't give any indication that he expected something more. As they reached the middle of the movie, Annabelle even relaxed and could follow the plot properly. On the way home, they enthusiastically discussed the film, and the girl unexpectedly realized that doing things with Vince wasn't any more difficult than what she used to do with her friend. We're just friends, she told herself. A guy and a girl can be friends, right? Right? She repeated the same to herself in the following weekends when Vince invited her to the City Day celebration. And then, when the girl mustered up the courage and invited him to the woods, wanting to show him places she had known since childhood. The local nature didn't particularly inspire the guy. That was clear from the very beginning. And when they noticed wild boar tracks by the river, Vince fell into a quiet panic. And you walk here alone, Annabelle, he asked, astonished. Without a gun? Without any protection? Why would I need a gun? Annabelle was surprised. I'm not planning to kill anyone. Tell me, aren't you afraid of wild boars either? Vince persisted. Annabelle. It's reckless. Do you even know what those animals' tusks can do to a person? It'll be too late to laugh after such an encounter, and no doctor will be able to help you. Annabelle tried in vain to explain to him that she had been walking in these areas for 20 years and nothing bad had ever happened to her. Vince developed an aversion to the forest, constantly lecturing the girl and trying to dissuade her from these walks. But everything was in vain. She couldn't understand his fears, and Vince couldn't comprehend why Annabelle loved the forest so much. In one thing, however, he turned out to be right. Such places indeed attracted suspicious individuals. If not more. 
After all, it was in the woods that Annabelle became a witness to a murder. A murder that almost happened. I asked you not to go there. Vince repeated again and again as they drove into the woods. I asked, but you didn't listen. Now drive slower, Annabelle asked him. I tied a ribbon on that tree, near which we need to get out of the car. It's very dark now, and we don't want to miss that spot. Vince looked at her grimly but followed her request. Annabelle kept a close eye on the trees. We should have brought a rifle, Vince said. Edward from the house across the street supposedly has one. Or even better, we should have called the police. I don't understand. Why didn't I think of that before? Probably due to the shock when you came to me. I couldn't think straight. We don't need a rifle, Annabelle said. I already told you that the killer left. But he could have come back. Vince objected. Did you think about that? What will we do if we encounter him? We won't encounter him, Annabelle replied. Everything will be fine. Vince snorted skeptically but didn't argue with her. It was evident that he remained unconvinced. Wait. Annabelle shouted. Here's my ribbon. A white handkerchief tied to a tree was clearly visible among the thickets. Vince grimly glanced at it and got out of the car. Which way, he asked tersely. Annabelle led him into the thicket, silently praying that they would get lost. She also hoped that the stranger was alive. Otherwise, what was the point of all this? It would mean that her desperate race, the unknown guy's suffering, and Vince's grumbling were all in vain. That shouldn't be. Here. Annabelle whispered, stepping out from behind the trees. There he is, near the log. See for yourself. In the darkness, it was impossible to tell whether the stranger was alive or not. He didn't move or make a sound. If Annabelle hadn't known for sure that it was a person in front of her, she would have thought it was a log. Vince knelt down next to him and checked his pulse. With her heart pounding, Annabelle waited for the paramedic to say something. He's alive, Vince pronounced. The girl let out a relieved but loud exhale. Vince flinched in fear. Shining the flashlight, Vince proceeded to examine the wound on the stranger's head and then felt his ribs. No fractures, it seems, Vince said. That's strange. Why is it strange? Annabelle didn't understand. Because there was likely no fight. Well, hardly any fight, Vince corrected himself. Perhaps he was simply hit in the face. And then in the head to knock him unconscious. He didn't even have time to put up a fight. That's for the best. At least I won't have to treat any fractures. What should we do now? Annabelle asked. Can I help you somehow? Yes, we need to, Vince nodded. I think this man wouldn't appreciate it if I just threw him over my shoulder and carried him to the car. You'll help me. I'll grab him by the shoulders, and you take his legs. Can you do it? Bravely, Annabelle nodded. What else could she do? She couldn't just leave the stranger in the woods. Especially since she desperately wanted to save him. The return journey took much longer. To Annabelle, it felt endless. Vince walked backward, stumbling over roots a couple of times. The girl kept her eyes fixed on the injured man's face and worried intensely about his condition. She feared that their help was causing more harm than good. Mentally, she apologized to the stranger. The only consolation was that with each step, the car that seemed to appear behind every tree was getting closer. We should have brought a stretcher. Vince said. Or even better, an assistant. I'll keep that in mind for the future. The girl didn't reply. Her hands were simply giving out from the weight. She had no strength left for conversation. The sight of Vince's car, appearing from behind yet another tree, seemed like a miracle to her. Let's lay him on the back seat. Vince said. Wait. I'll just open the door. They placed the stranger in the car and took a few seconds to rest. Annabelle was ready to collapse from exhaustion. What do you think? Who is he? she asked. Vince shrugged. 
How would I know, I he said. Some kind of thug or an important figure, as you said. Was he brought here in an expensive car? Yes. Seems like it, Annabelle replied. I'm not very knowledgeable about cars, but that one looked expensive. Like a real tank. Definitely a thug, Vince repeated convincingly. Just look at his beard, no ordinary person would wear that. I think he hasn't shaved in a long time, Annabelle observed. There's nothing criminal about that. Vince snorted skeptically. Annabelle realized that the stranger didn't sit well with the paramedic from the first glance. Vince got behind the wheel, and Annabelle sat next to him, anxiously looking at the injured man. Please drive carefully, she asked Vince. What if he has internal injuries? Remind me, which one of us is a doctor? You or me? Vince asked, pressing the gas pedal. When they arrived in their small village, most of the rural houses were without lights. Most of the villagers had gone to bed. It was at that moment that the most important question came to Annabelle's mind. Where should we take him, she asked. To your house or your workplace? But who will look after him during the night? Vince pondered for a moment. In any case, we'll have to take him to the city in the morning. I don't have a clinic here, and I don't have any equipment. Not even an x-ray machine. I can give injections, though. That's about it. Then let's go to your place, Annabelle said. You'll examine this man and go to sleep, and I'll take care of him during the night. You have work tomorrow, but you're very tired. You can barely stand on your feet. I can handle it. Vince looked at her skeptically. You'll stay at my place overnight? What will Mrs. Flores say? Nothing, the girl replied, blushing. I'll call my grandma and tell her that I'm helping you take care of the injured man. She'll understand. They carried the injured man into the living room and laid him on the couch. Vince grumbled in dissatisfaction. The upholstery on the couch will be ruined. We should have laid a sheet down. Examine him, please, Annabelle requested. In case he needs any help. He definitely needs help, but don't expect much from me, Vince replied. Without proper equipment and medication, there's not much I can do. He brought his small case and laid out some instruments and forceps. As he worked, he continued to mutter. All of this is a strange story. Very strange, and I don't like that we got involved in it. Can you imagine what will happen if they find out about us? Who? Annabelle didn't understand. The person who tried to kill our injured man, Vince said. What if he decides to check whether this man is dead or not? He'll go back to the woods, find no one there, and continue searching here. Of course, his first stop will be the doctor's. And who will he find here? his dead body, and the two of us. What do you think? Who will end up with a bag over their head this time? And what do you suggest, the girl sighed. To leave him as he is and leave him without help? I suggest we go to the police as soon as possible, gloomy Vince answered. From the early morning, or even better, right now. Let them figure it out. What's what in this story? No need to involve the police, the injured man mumbled. The young people stared at him in shock. Annabelle hesitantly asked. I didn't imagine it, did I? You heard it too, right? Yes, Vince nodded. So, sometimes, he regains consciousness. Let's wait. Maybe he'll say something else. They fell silent, but the wounded man showed no signs of life. Soon, Annabelle began to think that she had imagined the man's voice. He most likely has a traumatic brain injury, muttered Vince, examining the man of unknown severity. In any case, we need to take him to the hospital and report what happened. But let's not involve the police, Annabelle remarked. That's not for you to decide, Vince replied. We might have a criminal case on our hands. And am I supposed to stay silent about it? But he asked you not to, the girl insisted. You heard what Howard said. We don't need the police. And how do you know his name? Vince asked. I overheard the killer talking about him on the phone, Annabelle answered. I told you about it. 
Vince didn't ask any more questions but looked unusually displeased. Annabelle couldn't understand what she had done wrong in his eyes. That night, the girl barely slept, sitting at the table and listening to the injured man's heavy breathing. At her request, Vince went to bed, but he couldn't sleep either. Annabelle heard his heavy sighs and grumbling, this night was difficult for all three of them. In the morning, the stranger opened his eyes. Hello, Vince greeted him rather unkindly. Howard, if I'm not mistaken? The guy stared at the paramedic, seemingly not understanding what was happening. It was understandable after everything the stranger had been through. He could easily have forgotten what had happened to him yesterday. And now, new troubles. Complete strangers. A new place. Some kind of interrogation. How are you feeling? Annabelle asked, trying to sound as friendly as possible. The stranger looked at Annabelle for a long time, and the girl began to fear that he wouldn't answer. But the man finally opened his mouth. Could be better, he hoarsely muttered. Vince smirked. Annabelle quickly asked. Would you like something to drink? Shall I bring you some water? Better bring some sweet tea, Vince chimed in. Annabelle, put the kettle on. And we'll talk in the meantime. However, the paramedic's intentions were unsuccessful. The stranger didn't want to speak, it seemed difficult for him. The only thing they could understand was that the guy adamantly refused to go to the police or the hospital. Vince was furious. You brought a gift from the woods, he grumbled, stepping into the kitchen. Can't say thank you for that. Annabelle was taken aback. She had never seen Vince in such a state, and it unpleasantly surprised her. So, what are you going to do, she timidly asked. Exactly what I should do. Vince replied. I'll call an ambulance, and they'll come. I should have done it yesterday. Then you'll give your statement to the police, or if you want, we'll just say we found him in the woods without any details. Let them figure it out. But you can't do that. Annabelle said. Howard asked you not to do it. I think you should listen to him and not just turn away from him. He's not a kitten or a puppy, he's an adult. He knows better what's best for him. Vince looked at her with a hint of disappointment. I thought you were on my side. Of course, I'm on your side, the girl confirmed. But wait a minute. Did you have a fight with Howard that I need to take someone's side? Just do as he asks, that's all. Childish, Vince muttered. And what if he dies? What will we do, left holding a corpse? And what if he survives? Annabelle persisted. Can't you see that he's talking to us and seems capable of thinking? Would a person near death behave like this? The human brain is a mysterious thing, Vince said didactically. Ah, uh. why am I even talking to you? It's all just a movie, toys for you. Stories about the kind doctor. He'll heal everyone, right? But how I'm going to do that is none of your concern, right? They fell silent. Annabelle was embarrassed by Vince's reproach and didn't know what to say. The young man muttered. Fine. Okay, you win. Who'll sit with him then? So, you agree? Annabelle skeptically asked. And where am I going to go? Vince said grumpily. We're surrounded on all sides. Who'll sit with him? Tell me. We have work, and someone should also keep an eye on him. Maybe we should call Mrs. Flores? She's probably bored in retirement anyway. Let her have some entertainment. Grandma, the girl questioned with doubt. No, it's better not to bother her. I'll sit with him myself. I'll call Mrs. Russell and ask her to work at the post office for me today. After all, it's her position, and I'm just filling in. Even with your own salary? Are you willing to sacrifice that? Vince sighed and looked at the clock. It's time for me to run to work. There might be patients waiting by the office. I'll write down instructions for you and leave. Hopefully, you haven't forgotten how to administer injections? Annabelle had indeed played the role of a nurse for some time when her grandmother had blood pressure issues. 
however, she had never had to administer injections to strangers. The girl didn't dare to argue with Vince, but for one reason. She knew that if she did, he would definitely call for an ambulance. And that couldn't be done. Annabelle herself didn't know why. After conversing with the paramedic, she returned to the living room. The wounded man lay on the couch. His eyes were closed. The girl sat down next to him, unsure of what to do. Where am I? The stranger asked, without opening his eyes. What is this place? You're in the house of a paramedic, Annabelle answered. You're in the village of Ashford. It's quite far from the city. Ashford, the guy repeated. Never heard of this place. He opened his eyes and looked at the girl. The stranger's gaze was weary but clear and conscious. Annabelle suddenly gathered courage and said. Maybe we should introduce ourselves? It feels awkward to constantly address you formally. The guy pondered for a moment but replied. Howard. Ah. Uh. I'm Annabelle, the girl replied. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, he responded uncertainly. Annabelle. So, how did I end up here in the first place? It was a very difficult question. The girl didn't possess enough knowledge in psychology to determine whether she should tell him about the attempted murder or not. Do you remember anything yourself? She cautiously asked. The man furrowed his brow in thought and dropped his hand onto the blanket. Fragments, he mumbled. I was near the river, searching for someone, and then I don't remember. Were you looking for a blonde person in an expensive car? Annabelle wanted to ask but caught herself in time. All of this was not her concern. Vince left her for the paramedic, not the investigator. That was the job that needed to be done first and foremost. Vince said you can have some sweet tea, but not too much, Annabelle said. Would you like me to bring it? This day passed very strangely. At least, it was unusual for Annabelle. They hardly spoke with Howard. He was not in a state to engage in lengthy conversations. The girl administered his injection, brewed more tea, and simply sat nearby, listening to her new acquaintance's breathing, praying for everything to be fine with him. After all, she had convinced Vince not to call an ambulance. Therefore, if something happened to Howard, it would be entirely her fault. After lunch, Mrs. Flores came to the house. She quite literally peeked in first through the door slit, and only then did she appear on the threshold. Annabelle had a distinct feeling that her grandmother didn't believe the story about the wounded man until the very end. She must have been afraid of interrupting some romantic scene. What do you have here, she asked, entering the room and glancing around. Mrs. Flores's sharp gaze caught everything at once. The wounded man on the couch. The table turned into a real pharmacy. Her exhausted granddaughter. Grandma. Quiet. Annabelle requested. Can't you see that Howard is sleeping right now? He shouldn't be worried. Howard. Mrs. Flores asked with curiosity, looking at the guy. Where did he come from, and what happened? I'll tell you everything later, Annabelle replied. For now, let's keep quiet. Okay? Grandma complied. She sat down next to her and began to examine the stranger. After a while, she softly said. He has a decent face. Seems like he's not just some random person. Thank you, Howard muttered, opening his eyes. It's nice to hear that. Mrs. Flores clutched her heart and nervously laughed. It's not nice to eavesdrop, by the way, she said. Good day. How did you manage to get into such trouble? I haven't figured it out myself yet, the guy replied. Seems like I didn't rest too well in the woods. I had an unfortunate encounter, and here's the result. You sure have interesting meetings. Mrs. Flores remarked. By any chance, are you a bandit? Grandma. Annabelle reprimanded her. She felt very uncomfortable in front of the patient. First, Vince mistook him for a criminal and now her own grandmother with these awkward questions. However, the wounded man seemed not to be offended. On the contrary, a smile appeared on his lips. 
You don't need to worry. I haven't killed or robbed anyone, he assured Mrs. Flores. On the contrary, I suspect I became a victim of a cunning conspiracy. I just need to remember how it all happened. In order for you to remember everything, you need to rest more and regain strength, Annabelle interjected. Grandma, can't you see that Howard is exhausted? Let him rest. Don't tire him with conversation. All right, the woman nodded. And I also see that your patient is dressed quite differently from what a sick person should wear. Look, all the clothes are dirty. But we don't have any spare clothes, Annabelle said embarrassedly. I can't just rummage through Vince's closets without permission. Besides, it seems that their sizes are different. I'll bring some clothes from my late husband, Mrs. Flores told Howard. They should fit you. And for now, rest. I won't disturb you. Goodbye. She left, and the guy said, your grandmother is a saint. I've rarely met people like her. You can trust me on that. So, you do remember your past after all, a joyful Annabelle asked. Is your memory returning? I haven't forgotten my past, Howard replied. Who could forget something like that? I just don't remember how I ended up here and what happened to me. Annabelle wanted to ask clarifying questions. Should they call his relatives and inform them of his whereabouts? But his expression stopped her. It seemed that not everything in his biography had gone smoothly. Otherwise, he would have asked about it himself. What kind of relatives were they? The ones Howard felt more comfortable with Annabelle and her grandmother than with his own family? They didn't speak much after that. Annabelle offered Howard something to eat, but he had no appetite. He slept most of the day. In the evening, Mrs. Flores arrived with the promised clothes, and later, Vince returned from work. Is he alive? He asked Annabelle from the doorway. The girl nodded. Vince walked into the room and looked at the patient. The man politely greeted him. Hello, doctor. It seems we didn't get acquainted properly yesterday. Thank you for your help. Vince nodded dryly and turned to the girl. How are things going? He asked abruptly. Not very well, Annabelle admitted. Howard hasn't eaten anything, and he complained to me once that he felt nauseous. Dizziness? Any problems with hearing or vision? Vince inquired of the injured man. He still spoke dryly and abruptly, as if filling out a form. It was evident that the paramedic was simply dreaming of getting rid of this problematic patient as soon as possible. Tomorrow, I'll bring some more tablets, he told Annabelle. Although, honestly, this whole story is starting to annoy me. It would have been much easier to take him to the hospital and forget about all of this. Vince looked agitated and tired. The girl couldn't help but feel sorry for him. Just a few more days, she pleaded. And then Howard will leave and we won't hear about him anymore. Please, be patient. Annabelle folded her hands in a prayer gesture. Vince looked at her with melancholy and sighed. Will you stay the night again today, he asked. Aren't you afraid of rumors spreading around the village? Where would they come from? Annabelle exclaimed. I'm not some celebrity to be followed around. Who would even know where I live? And nobody in the village will find out? Vince scoffed. Annabelle. Sometimes I feel like I've been living here my whole life, not you. The locals are always looking for something to gossip about. I've seen it myself. The paramedic's words proved true a few days later when someone knocked on his door. Annabelle thought it was Mrs. Flores and casually shouted, Come in, Granny. But instead, Goldie appeared at the doorstep. Hello, she said coldly. So, you've settled in nicely here, huh, friend? Can I congratulate you on officially getting married? Annabelle flinched and looked at Howard. He seemed to be sleeping. To avoid any risks, she rushed towards her friend and pushed her out of the door. Hey, what are you doing? Goldie exclaimed. What do you want? Annabelle asked dryly. Nothing, her friend replied. I just wanted to see how you and Vince are living here. See if you'd invite me to your wedding or if you've completely erased old friends from your life. 
It seems like my friends erased me themselves, Annabelle remarked. Isn't that right? You were the first to stop talking to me and didn't want to listen to any explanations. Talking to Goldie after months of silence turned out to be very difficult. Annabelle felt like she didn't know the person standing in front of her. You took my guy away, and it's my fault, right? Goldie protested. Then she added in a more peaceful tone. What? Won't you even invite me in for a cup of tea? Let's sit down and chat like old times. Another time, Annabelle replied. I don't have time right now. It seemed like Annabelle spoke that last sentence in vain. Her former friend began to suspect something. What's happening here, she asked. Are you and Vince hiding something? Maybe you've taken a child from an orphanage without telling anyone? Or are you just settling down as a family? Let me see. Despite Annabelle's protests, Goldie burst into the room and froze at the sight. She stared at the sleeping Howard for a few moments before turning to Annabelle. Who is this, she asked. A friend of Vince's, Annabelle automatically lied and quickly added, a friend. Goldie squinted skeptically. A friend? In this state? You're hiding something. Tell me what's going on, or I'll go to the police. Maybe you and Vince almost killed someone, and now you're trying to heal them? What nonsense! Annabelle exclaimed. How could you think that about me? After your betrayal, I can think anything I want, Goldie said sharply. Tell me everything as it happened. Annabelle realized there was nowhere to escape. She took her friend outside and told her everything. You. You actually saw the killer with your own eyes? Goldie couldn't believe it. You saw it firsthand? Yes, Annabelle confirmed. And you weren't afraid to search for the body? Goldie asked. Wow, I thought you weren't capable of doing something like that. You only know how to sit with your books and steal other people's fiancés. I didn't steal anyone, Annabelle sighed. It just happened. Nothing just happens, Goldie said. Fine. I'll go. Stay here in your hospital. Goldie was about to leave, and Annabelle hastily said to her. Goldie. Promise me you won't tell anyone about what you saw here. Please, don't say anything. It's a secret. It will harm Vince. We'll see, Goldie replied and walked away. Annabelle felt uneasy in her soul. She went back inside the house and noticed that Howard had woken up. She tried to maintain a calm demeanor so as not to needlessly frighten him. How are you feeling, she asked. Would you like something to drink or eat? It's not time for your medication yet. Thank you, the man unexpectedly said. For what? Annabelle didn't understand. I thought you just found me in the woods. But it turns out you're my savior. It's invaluable. I owe you for life now. Annabelle blushed. So, you heard everything, she mumbled. Too bad. I didn't want you to find out like this. In my opinion, everything happened right on time, the man objected. I'm already feeling better. I'm starting to remember some things, and your words completed the picture. But that's not important right now. Howard tried to get up from the couch, and Annabelle rushed to help him. Shall I escort you to the bathroom, she asked nervously. Or to the kitchen. Tell me, what do you want? Howard just laughed in response to her words. In reality, it's much simpler, he replied, taking her hand and bringing it to his lips. Annabelle felt like her face was about to catch fire. She pulled her hand back and pushed the guy back onto the couch. What do you want from me, she said, embarrassed. Is this some kind of nightly romance? It's the least I can do to thank you, Howard said. After all, people don't save each other's lives every day, right? Agree. And any other girl in your place would have just passed by me. Not many would have gone into the bushes hoping to revive a corpse. The chances were slim, anyway. It's just a normal thing to do, Annabelle firmly replied. Any person would have done the same in my place. However, Howard disagreed with her. 
He didn't tell her his own story. But life had taught him that even the closest person would sooner push you to the edge of the abyss than come to your aid, and his wife Wendy turned out to be the best tormentor in that regard. Howard didn't know what attracted him to her. It seemed like some kind of sorcery. And it all started quite normally. Wendy came to his office for an interview. Good afternoon, she greeted Howard as she entered the room. My name is Wendy Jackson. I called you on Friday about the pharmacist vacancy. Remember? Howard nodded absent-mindedly. Yes, yes, I remember. Please come in. Have a seat. He owned a chain of pharmacies and, by his standards, was quite wealthy. He built his business on his own, without any influential relatives. It was all thanks to his diligence and luck. From a young age, Howard was active. Following his father's advice, he enrolled in medical college, even though he had no burning desire to become a doctor. However, it helped him in the future. During his studies, the young man made many useful connections and acquaintances that aided him in building his business. He would have made a bad doctor. Howard understood that himself. He couldn't even get used to the sight of blood. He couldn't look at it without internal revulsion, let alone treat others. But he had the mindset of a businessman. Howard had a knack for many things, and he often followed his intuition. And he had an abundance of optimism. That's why he didn't take his friend Luther's timid objections into account when he proposed they venture into the pharmacy business. It's a worthwhile endeavor, Howard said. And we'll make it work. We'll take a loan. I have acquaintances who can provide us with a cheaper space. I've already talked to them. Things are also falling into place with the medications. Say yes, to this. I don't know, Luther replied. It's risky. I wouldn't want to fail and end up with nothing. As if you're making a fortune in your office, Howard remarked. We have a chance to rise. In the end, Luther reluctantly agreed. Howard himself didn't know why he chose Luther specifically. Perhaps their long-standing friendship played a role. He somehow believed that someone you've known for many years can be trusted completely. How wrong he was. At first, things didn't go very well for the friends. Despite the support they received, starting a business from scratch was a tough endeavor. Luther kept complaining and had already said, goodbye, to his money. However, Howard didn't lose heart. He had relied on his luck for a reason. Gradually, everything started to fall into place. The friends opened another pharmacy in a different neighborhood, and then another and another. Luther, after switching from a modest car to a flashy one, stopped complaining about life and often acted as if everything they achieved was solely due to his merit. Howard knew this, but he didn't tell his friend. It was understandable that Luther wanted to impress his relatives and acquaintances. Luther was a smart guy, but he was a pessimist and a complainer. He had never attracted attention before and couldn't resist taking advantage of the moment. Howard didn't take all of this too seriously. The sudden attention from women also didn't go to his head. Many of his female acquaintances, whom he used to greet with a nod in passing, unexpectedly started giving him flirty looks and making quite transparent hints that they wouldn't mind taking their relationship to a new level. Howard found it amusing and repulsive at the same time. It's amazing how many people have shown their true colors, he told Luther one day. Are you talking about girls again? Luther asked. Not just them, Howard sighed. Although that's unpleasant too. Do you remember Ida Barnes? She studied with me in college. Have you bumped into her at parties? Is she the tall blonde? Luther became interested. With long legs? Of course, I remember. How could anyone forget her? Half of your group had a crush on her. And what about Katerina? Did she write to you too? Worse. Howard replied. She was lurking around my house, pretending to accidentally run into me. Tell me, how is that possible? If she's been living on the other side of the city for a long time? And there's also some guy from the village, Howard continued without listening to him. I asked about him. 
He's actually a relative of mine, but a distant one. I had no idea he even existed. And now he comes asking for money for his daughter's treatment. Supposedly, his family is in a difficult situation and can't manage without my help. I only gave him a little money to get rid of him. Because judging by his appearance and the smell of alcohol, he's just a regular alcoholic. Unlike Luther, who, after gaining money, indulged in all sorts of entertainment, Howard was immersed in work. He didn't have time for a personal life. The last hope was that fate would find him at work. And that's exactly what happened when Wendy came for an interview. The girl looked very stylish, but not vulgar. Minimal makeup, a strict suit. However, with her appearance, Wendy could dress in a trash bag and still draw all the attention. But Howard didn't immediately appreciate all of this. He had some issues with bills. The next medicine delivery was delayed, and one of the pharmacies was short of a pharmacist. Wendy, who was applying for the position, interested him primarily as a professional. Her appearance was secondary at that moment. The girl could have been any scarecrow or even a man. Howard was primarily interested in her resume. I see that you have work experience, he muttered, flipping through papers. Can you tell me why you decided to leave your previous job? I moved to another neighborhood. It was too far from my previous workplace, the girl readily replied. Besides, that pharmacy mostly dealt with herbs and vitamins. I'd like to move on to something more serious to provide real help to people. She delivered this speech in a serious tone. However, her eyes gleamed with mischief. If Howard hadn't been burdened with problems, he might have suspected something. He would have realized that she was just another fortune hunter who found out that the owner of the pharmacy chain was still single. Unfortunately, at that moment, he had no time to solve puzzles. Your positive attitude is reassuring, Howard smiled. Well then. Your resume is satisfactory to me. I think we can hire you. You won't be disappointed, Wendy promised with a smile. And that turned out to be true. The girl quickly adapted to the new place. There were no complaints about her. Howard didn't visit the pharmacies often himself, and their next meeting happened only after a month. It was then that he noticed for the first time that the girl was very attractive, and he surprised himself. Where were his eyes during the interview? Good day, Mr. Lewis. Wendy greeted him. The weather today is simply marvelous, isn't it? When you say that, Howard blushed. I feel like a slave owner. If it weren't for my pharmacy, you could be sunbathing on the beach right now or enjoying yourself somewhere outside the city. It feels unfair. Oh, not at all. I'm not reproaching you, and I don't regret anything, the girl objected and turned to an elderly lady who entered the store. Hello? Can I help you with something, she asked, still smiling calmly. To anyone who, like Howard, saw Wendy for the first time, she could seem perfect. Beautiful, kind, with a gentle smile on her face. It seemed like her mood was always cloudless. Who in their right mind would refuse such an employee or wife? No one in the world could even think that it was all just a mask. Wendy set herself a goal to get married successfully and was ready to do anything for it. It didn't matter that in the evenings she scrutinized herself critically in the mirror, anxiously waiting for the first signs of wrinkles. She gritted her teeth, realizing that time was slipping away aimlessly. She felt jealous of Howard's potential competitors. During the day, she was still the same smiling girl who was impossible not to like. She charmed everyone, trying to find the key to Howard's heart. There wasn't much information about him. What could, for example, the cleaner Mrs. Parker know? The one who mopped the floor at the pharmacy. Wendy learned from someone that Howard had an allergy to cottonwood fluff. Supposedly, he had mentioned it when he visited the pharmacy in June. Wendy's partner told her that the boss treated his employees very well. He gave various gifts for Christmas or birthdays. And he treated the customers well too. They always had some promotions going on. All of these were insignificant details that didn't bring Wendy any closer to her goal. Unbeknownst to her, Luther came to her aid, once stopping by the pharmacy. 
Good day, ladies, the pharmacist greeted, winking at Wendy. I see you're just sitting here, wagging your tongues. You should at least do some stretching exercises. Otherwise, you'll lose your perfectly sculpted figures ahead of time. Wendy's partner, being more modest, was taken aback by such a remark. But the girl chuckled. We should take an example from you, Mr. Martin. You're always driving around in your car. And Mr. Lewis too. You could switch to bicycles. Take care of your health. Luther didn't interest Wendy too much, except as a backup option. Some seventh sense told her that Howard was still the main focus. And she wasn't accustomed to settling for second place. So she kept Luther on a short leash. Not exactly pushing him away, but not giving him any hope either. Although Wendy appealed to Luther. She felt it. She understood it from the looks he threw her way. No. Bicycles are not for me, Luther sighed. Don't get me wrong, but all that dust, dirt. It's not aesthetically pleasing to me. Besides, I prefer less injury-prone sports. Like a treadmill, for example. Bicycles are for Howard. He rides through the forest every weekend. He doesn't worry about his health at all. Riding through the forest? Wendy became interested. Is that where they opened the new ski trail? I've never seen Howard there. I have no idea where it is, Luther replied. And you, Wendy, are you into cycling? I would have never guessed. I am, the girl nodded. Mr. Martin, I'm a very mysterious person. It would never cross your mind what I can be passionate about. Perhaps you could give me a hint? Luther asked with a smile. Fortunately, a new customer entered the pharmacy and saved Wendy from further conversation with this fool. Honestly, the girl had a low opinion of men in general. In her opinion, men were only good for extracting money from them. Well, or providing useful information, which Luther did. Now Wendy knew Howard's weak spot and was ready to go into battle. During her school years, she used to ride a bicycle. A few hours of practice made her a master of cycling again. On the following Sunday, the girl set off into the woods on her hunt. However, her weapon was not a rifle but a bicycle. Wendy started her search from the ski base. That famous place that was popular in their city during the summer months. Seeing where she ended up, the girl's spirits sank a little. There were indeed a lot of people here. Too many to find that one person in this crowd. Cyclists raced past her quickly. Some athletes ran by. Wendy stood in place, clenching her fists in despair. She already felt that this venture was doomed. Howard wasn't here. And even if he was, it seemed impossible to spot him. It was easier to find a needle in a haystack than to find her own boss in the forest. This time, Howard must have had no luck. Because Wendy still found him. The culprit turned out to be the kindness of a man who came to help a complete stranger. What do we have here? Scraped your knee? Well, well, don't cry. You're a man, after all. Wendy flinched and turned around upon hearing a familiar voice. She didn't immediately understand what was happening. And then she spotted a little boy wiping his tear-streaked cheeks. His worried mother and Howard were bustling around him. But of course. Where else could she find this Robin Hood but at the scene of the incident? The girl immediately understood the role she needed to play. The caring Mary Poppins, who adored children. Trying on this new persona, she dove into the crowd. And who do we have here crying, she spoke, approaching the child. Such a big boy and scared of a little scratch. I'll apply a magical bandage on the wound, and it will all be better in no time. Wendy deliberately pretended not to notice her boss. If Howard realized she had been watching him, her plan would have failed. She leaned over the child and patiently awaited her boss's response, which came without delay. Wendy. Howard asked in surprise. And you're here too? The woman turned to him and exclaimed with joy, Mr. Lewis. Oh, what a small world. And I see you're still helping people, Howard remarked. It seems I was right when I hired you. You're always eager to help, 
both on weekdays and weekends. Wendy smiled and took out a bandage from her backpack. She applied it to the child's knee and winked at him. They're all better now. It hurts less already, right? And soon it will be completely gone. Don't worry. The child's mother showered them with gratitude, while Wendy silently praised herself for her foresight. She hadn't taken the bandage for nothing. It was not in vain, even though she had taken it for herself, worried about getting blisters from her new sneakers. The woman and the child left, and Wendy and Howard looked at each other. Thank you so much, the man said. I didn't have a first aid kit myself. Words alone didn't work on that child. I was afraid that his mother wouldn't appreciate my attempts to use words. I also have medication for high blood pressure and headaches, the girl boasted. Once on a walk, I met an old man who felt unwell. I was very worried until I called for an ambulance. Since then, I decided not to take risks and carry something with me. You never know when medication might come in handy. Right? Of course, it was all a bluff. Wendy perfectly understood that Howard wouldn't delve into her bag to check her words. However, she made a mental note to replenish her first aid kit. The girl was always attentive to details, and that was the key to her success in her schemes. Oh, what are you doing here? Wendy asked. Are you also into cycling? Howard looked a little flustered. Not fanatically, no. I just ride on weekends. It helps me unwind after a work week. You understand? Of course. That's exactly why I started cycling, the girl nodded. Maybe we can ride together? If it's not a violation of subordination, that is. After all, you're still my boss. Stop repeating that, Howard grimaced. Boss. Boss. In the woods, we're all equal. Of course, let's go cycling. I would be delighted to ride in your company. Wendy was initially thrilled by this statement. She imagined that she had already won over her boss. But then she realized that Howard's response was merely a display of politeness. He would have agreed to go for a ride with the janitor, Mrs. Parker, for the same reason, not wanting to offend her. Victory was still very, very far for Wendy. She needed a new plan. Talking while cycling was inconvenient, so Wendy immersed herself in thought. Soon, an idea came to her. Isn't it boring just riding like this? Don't you think, she asked Howard. You're into extreme sports, I assume, the man replied, surprised. Maybe you do mountain biking or plan to go on a round-the-world trip? No, that's a bit much for me, the girl shook her head. But I wouldn't mind picking up the pace a bit. Do you want to have a race? Howard suggested. Although I should warn you, competing with me won't be easy. I'm not a professional, just an amateur, but I have experience. The competition would be unfair. And don't celebrate victory prematurely, Wendy laughed. I'm not as simple as I seem. It's still unknown who will reach the finish line first. Of course, these words were yet another lie. But Wendy wasn't concerned about that. Victory over Howard was not her intention. She had a completely different plan in mind. Letting her boss take the lead, Wendy pedaled with all her might. She waited for the right moment to stage a minor accident. The girl had studied Howard well enough to know that he wouldn't forgive himself for such an incident, especially if his companion got hurt. And as they say, from pity to love is just one step. Wendy only failed to consider one thing, that the accident could actually happen. She believed in herself so much that the thought never crossed her mind. Not noticing a route on the road, Wendy failed to slow down in time and tumbled to the ground. For a moment, all she felt was pain. Wendy didn't immediately understand what had happened. Someone nearby was calling her name. Are you okay? Howard asked anxiously as he rushed to her. Wendy, you're bleeding. The girl looked fearfully at her hands. The skin on her right palm was scraped, and her wrist hurt badly. Her knees were also in pain, but Wendy didn't have time to assess the damage. Tears welled up in her eyes. It hurts, she complained. 
this time, it was absolutely sincere. Wendy had never felt so terrible before. Did you break anything? Howard asked, grabbing her injured hand. Can you stand? We need to get you to the hospital as soon as possible. My hand hurts, but I think I can bend it, Wendy replied. And my legs. She looked at her sports pants, which she had chosen online every day. She saw huge and unsightly holes on her knees, and tears streamed down her cheeks with renewed force. Howard understood in his own way. Wait for me here, the man requested. The ski base is nearby. I'll take the bikes there and come back for you. Then we'll go to the trauma specialist. Don't worry. Wendy barely listened to him, preoccupied with her own concerns. Only when Howard disappeared from view did she realize that things weren't turning out so bad after all. She had still achieved her goal. Her boss was genuinely concerned about her and her facial injury. She didn't even need to pretend. In order to successfully get married, the girl was willing to endure even a fracture that didn't actually exist. Wendy carefully bent her arm and calmed down. At worst, it was a sprain. She smiled with relief but quickly erased the smile from her face as Howard approached. Wendy. Are you okay? he asked with concern. Is everything all right? Not really, the girl replied. My leg hurts a lot. I think I can walk, but very slowly. Wendy eagerly awaited his response. How would the man act? Howard fully lived up to her hopes and, like a true knight, offered. I'll carry you to the car. The girl didn't object much. She blushed slightly, but only for appearance's sake. In reality, Wendy dreamed of all her friends witnessing this moment. Mr. Lewis is carrying me in his arms, she thought with delight. It's like a scene from a movie. Her excitement grew even further when she found herself in Howard's car. Leather seats, air conditioning, and such luxury were almost within her reach. I'm sorry, Howard said as he sat behind the wheel. If it weren't for me, none of this would have happened. Yeah, what does it have to do with you, the girl sighed. I overestimated my own abilities. And I suggested this unfair competition, Howard remarked. To compete with a girl. Imagine that. Don't misunderstand me. I don't consider you weak at all. You're just so delicate and ethereal, Wendy. Dancing suits you better than cycling. So we're in agreement, the girl nodded. As a sign of reconciliation, you'll have to invite me to dance. After I recover, of course. I just have to outdo you in something. It was at that moment, looking at Howard's embarrassed and guilty face, that Wendy realized the wedding was almost within her grasp. Manipulating him wouldn't be a difficult task. And how could such a simpleton manage to build a business? Probably because of money or love. Different hemispheres of the brain were responsible for those answers. And it seemed that love wasn't working out too well for this man. As Wendy expected, there were no fractures to be found. Just a slight sprain and some minor scratches that, if anything, only marred her appearance. Howard drove her home and helped her up to the fourth floor. Wendy smiled at the man. Thank you so much for this day. Despite how it ended, I really enjoyed our outing, she said. And still, please accept my apologies, Howard repeated. I will regret my overconfidence for the rest of my life. And I will remember this day with gratitude, Wendy replied. Where else could I have gotten to know you better? Over the next few days, the girl stayed home. Howard called her, inquired about her health, and even took her to a restaurant once. You can't dance yet, but at least watch how others do it, Howard suggested. His inherent caution had let him down for the first time in his life. Howard had forgotten about the scammers buzzing around him like an annoying swarm of bees. He forgot how Luther called Wendy a cunning little thing and even that he himself didn't trust women too much considering most of them to be quite deceitful. The girl played her role too well, and in his eyes, she seemed like an angel. Howard realized too late how he had made a mistake. The young couple got married a few months after the incident in the forest with their bicycles. They spent their honeymoon in China and then settled into Howard's apartment. 
The girl struggled in vain to play her former role. Pretending to be someone else 24-7 was impossible. Gradually, her true nature began to seep out. Maybe next month you can take a vacation? Wendy suggested a year after their wedding. Let's go to Brazil. It seems like a very interesting destination. I've always wanted to see the Statue of Christ. And all those soap operas my mother used to watch when I was little. They left an impression on me. I'd like to reminisce and see the places where they were filmed. What do you think? Shall we go? That evening, Howard was once again sorting through some papers and barely listening to what his wife was saying. His mind was preoccupied with work-related matters. To India, he said. Yes, Wendy. That's original. I was talking about Brazil, the girl said, offended. Can't you hear me, or have I turned into a painting, a piece of furniture? Since you don't even pay attention to me? About Brazil? Howard asked, confused. Exactly. So, what's the plan with Brazil? That's the point, there's no plan, Wendy yelled in anger. I just want to go there. She snatched the papers from her husband's hands and stepped aside. Howard looked at her in surprise. If you want it that badly, we'll definitely go there, he said. Whether it's Brazil or India. We can visit both countries, one after the other. But not now, next year. Would it be okay to fly there for Christmas? Why not now? Wendy asked aggressively. Howard shrugged. I simply don't have the money right now, and if I don't sort out these papers you just took away, it'll be a very long time before I do. Please, give me back the documents. No money, the girl questioned. How is that possible? Just last week, you were telling me about some profit. An upturn in business. I thought now we could finally take a break. All that money has already been invested in expanding the network, Howard replied in a conciliatory tone. We're opening a new branch. Remember? I've told you about it. A new branch? Wendy asked in a low voice. Again? And you mean to say we don't have any money for a trip? Even my friend Carolina travels abroad twice a year, and her husband is just a regular engineer. And as you yourself have said, their family is constantly in debt, Howard remarked. I'm sorry, but I don't think that's the right way to live. In my opinion, we should live within our means, rather than constantly being indebted to someone. And right now, I'm sorry, but I have to work. If I don't finish this task by morning, things will be very bad." Wendy glared at him angrily and threw the papers onto the table. Great, she said. Just wonderful. Then I won't bother you with work. I'll go for a walk alone, of course. You never seem to have time for that either. Howard called after her, but the girl didn't listen anymore. She grabbed her purse and headed towards the door. Wendy turned off her phone almost immediately after stepping outside. She knew perfectly well that her husband would call. Compassionate Howard, so sure of his righteousness. He would still want to apologize to her, find faults in his behavior. Perhaps he would even feel guilty for not listening attentively to his wife or suspect himself of being rude to Wendy. Howard was so naive. Usually, Wendy was fine with that. She took advantage of her husband's simplicity. But this time, she was furious. She didn't need his apologies, and she didn't care about going to Brazil, which seemed as distant as her ears. She just wanted to be away from her husband. Wendy was tired of playing her role. She didn't know where to go, so she went downtown. In the past, when she wasn't as well off, she would stroll past boutiques and restaurants. Enviously peering into shop windows and observing people sitting at tables. Now, Wendy was wealthy and could afford anything she wanted. Suddenly, she felt a strong desire to have a drink. Wendy remembered a restaurant where she and her husband often met with friends and decided to go there. She wanted to have some wine, or perhaps something stronger, without pretending or playing a role. What could be better in her current situation? Wendy entered the half-empty dining hall and chose a table by the window. Now she was on the other side of the glass. 
but as she looked at the people strolling by on the street, she didn't feel happy at all. It's all Howard's fault, the girl thought angrily. He earns so much money, and yet he still saves. What's the point of having money if some engineer's wife lives better than me? Then what are money even for? She drank a glass of wine and then impulsively ordered whiskey. She checked her phone and smirked at the five missed calls. Keep worrying, you idiot, she mentally addressed her husband. Well, you can crunch your numbers with that mood. You won't say anything. Wendy felt someone's gaze on her and turned her head. Some man sitting at the other end of the hall was looking at her. The girl made a displeased face. She didn't need any admirers with their shallow compliments. Wendy wasn't in the mood to make new acquaintances. Unexpectedly, she recognized the man and smiled. It was an acquaintance, even more than that, a family friend. The man at the table turned out to be Luther. Wendy waved to him warmly, and he took it as an invitation to join her table. Good evening, he greeted the girl. Are you alone today? Without your husband? Yes. Wendy nodded. He's buried in his papers and doesn't lift his head. Getting him out of there is almost science fiction. Luther shook his head in disappointment. I recognize Howard. Is he checking the budget again? I've gone through it three times. Everything's fine. But Howard, of course, knows better. He's capable of finding mistakes even where there are none. In my opinion, he has a talent for that. And in my opinion, it's just being nitpicky, Wendy muttered. We don't see life because of those numbers. Especially me. Howard might not care. He's insensitive. But I find it quite offensive that my life is passing by like this, stuck in one place. Meanwhile, others are flying to different cities and countries, drinking wine somewhere in Italy. And here I am sitting in a provincial cafe, looking at a boring street. What a dreary existence. Luther nodded thoughtfully. Yes, earning money for the sake of having numbers in the bank is quite reckless, as they say. No one knows when death will come. You should take everything you can from life while you have the chance. That's my philosophy. That's a very wise philosophy, Wendy agreed. It's a pity my husband doesn't share it. Luther nodded again and asked, shall we have a drink to that? Wendy held a wine glass in her hand and looked thoughtfully at her companion. Why didn't Wendy pay attention to Luther before? Yes, there was nothing special about him. But, on the other hand, there were so many men around who didn't take care of themselves. They wore wrinkled pants and shirts, reeking of alcohol. The girl wasn't particularly fond of blondes, but she was willing to overlook even that. If she compared Luther to many other men, he was quite something, and in terms of moral qualities, he far surpassed the dry Howard. Did you come here alone? Wendy asked. Did something happen between you and Lindsay? During the time Wendy was married, the family friend had already gone through several girlfriends, as Luther told her. The problem always arose with his partners. Sooner or later, they all wanted to have serious relationships. They started trying to change him, and as a man, he didn't like that. Now he had returned to his usual complaints. Lindsay and I broke up about a week ago, Luther confirmed. I guess I should say that we didn't get along. The story unfolded just like yours and Howard's. Lindsay turned out to be too righteous, even overly so, I would say. Something was always not right for her. Either I came back from work too late, or supposedly smelled like someone else's perfume. It turned into complete paranoia in the end. She thought I had something going on with her friend. It was absolutely absurd. As if I would ever have anything to do with that girl. And yet she found someone to be jealous of me with. If only you saw Lindsay's friend. A real wallflower. To be jealous of me for someone like her? It's just an insult. Wendy laughed heartily at this story. She found Luther's disheartened appearance amusing. I would actually like Howard to be jealous of me, she confessed. Even just a little bit. Lately, it seems like he has become too complacent. He probably thinks that the bonds of marriage are chains that have tied me to him. 
I'm sure if he were a little afraid of losing me, things could have been different. But how do I instill that fear in him? Luther smiled and looked at her. To instill fear, you need to create a threat, he said. And if you want, I can help with that. Wendy looked at him and unexpectedly burst into tears. She was deeply hurt by her husband. There wasn't a single close person around, except for Luther, who showed concern for her. They were both drunk and lonely. Wendy felt like she had nothing to lose. She came home, and in the morning, when Howard was ready to climb the walls with worry. Where were you, he pounced on his wife. I called you a hundred times, maybe even more. Are you trying to say that you didn't hear the phone ring or look at the screen? However, there's a huge difference between looking at the phone and wanting to call back, Wendy replied. Didn't it occur to you that I just didn't want to talk to you? She pushed him away and went into the room. Howard followed her. The problem is that you don't want to sit down and have a proper conversation, Howard said bitterly. You turn any issue into a scandal. Yesterday, I wanted to talk. But you were busy with your numbers, Wendy said. All those calculations are more interesting to you than spending time with me. Well, I won't bother you. Go ahead, check and calculate to your heart's content. From that moment, the relationship between the spouses soured. It took just one refusal from Howard's side, one unfulfilled request from his wife, for all of Wendy's self-imposed feelings towards him to disappear. Everything about her husband annoyed her. How pedantically he approached work, his soft voice that always spoke to her in a steady tone, how politely he treated his own employees and the cafe waitstaff. On the other hand, Luther was different. He didn't form any special friendly relationships with the staff. He only thought about business matters during working hours. And he spent his weekends as he should, having fun, attending various parties, or traveling. Having money and flights allowed him to leave the hometown and go far enough to return to work on Mondays. A couple of times, Wendy went out with Luther, making up the most ridiculous excuses, like going on a trip with her friends, and left the house. Sometimes she and Luther would simply go to a vacation home far from the city and spend weekends surrounded by nature, with candlelit dinners and champagne. Sometimes it seemed to the girl that she was living two lives or rather, Wendy began to consider Luther as her true family. Howard, on the other hand, was someone like an accountant, a person who provided her with money. It was convenient in some ways, but not in others. Surprisingly, it seemed that Howard was unaware of his wife's infidelity. At least, that's what Wendy thought. A normal husband would have interrogated his wife intensively, she thought contemptuously. But this one. What was it that attracted me to him in the first place? Was it just the money? More and more, the girl pondered on the mistake she had made. She should have paid attention to Luther from the beginning. He was more carefree, open, and suited her spirit. Besides, Luther had no less money than Howard. Everything could have turned out so well. One day, Wendy shared these thoughts with her lover, but in response, she heard only a sad laugh. Darling, don't imagine too much about me, he pleaded. Otherwise, I might develop a complex. Howard and I are not equal in our business. What do you mean? Wendy didn't understand. Howard invested much more money into those pharmacies than I did, Luther explained. Both financially and morally. He had some savings, something he inherited from his grandfather, and the necessary connections. As for me, I had only a few pennies. I was always reliant on Howard. In essence, he's the boss, and I'm his deputy. You wouldn't live as comfortably with me, my dear. Wendy pondered for a moment and angrily stomped her foot. But that's not fair, she exclaimed. You started together, building everything from scratch. And my husband just took it all for himself? It's simply unlawful, and we need to do something about it. What can we fight, my dear? Luther sighed. Back when we started, I was young and naive. A fool, in a word. I foolishly asked Howard to put everything in his name. He always pretended to be noble and wanted us to be co-founders. And I, out of stupidity, followed his lead. Do you understand? 
I felt unworthy and believed all that nonsense. I even insisted on it. In the end, Howard agreed with me. And now we have what we have. It's all very unfair, the girl repeated, pouting like a child. If I had opened a business with you, I would have divided everything equally between us. But you're not the boss, and the pharmacy doesn't belong to you, Luther said in a conciliatory tone, kissing her lips. So let's leave these sad conversations behind and talk about something more interesting. For example, where would you like to go next weekend? However much Luther tried to distract Wendy, thoughts of the injustice of the situation never left her mind. The girl kept thinking again and again about how she could fix everything. She tried to find a way out of the situation but couldn't find one, except for one, but thinking about it was too frightening. Wendy contemplated this idea for a whole month before finally opening up to her lover. I must take control of those pharmacies, she said. I must become the boss instead of Howard. Interesting, but how? Luther asked. Are you going to approach your husband and ask him to step aside? Not necessarily, Wendy shook her head. There are other ways. Such as? Luther inquired. For example, by inheriting Howard's business, the girl answered. What do you think of that option? Luther snorted disdainfully, as if she had said something amusing. It sounds too fantastical, he replied. Howard is as healthy as a bull. He used to never get off his bike, and now he spends his time at the gym. Probably trying to find some comfort. After all, you're hardly ever around. And this fool didn't suspect anything, Wendy sneered contemptuously. How can anyone respect such a person? Actually, he did suspect. Luther said, losing his previous cheerfulness. You know, he told me about his suspicions. Howard thinks you're involved with someone else. You know, your stories about numerous friends who suddenly found you so popular, they're stitched together with white thread. Why didn't Howard call me in for a conversation if he suspected something? Wendy asked anxiously. Why didn't he cause a scene and ask me directly? Don't you know him? Luther said. Howard simply fears offending you. Can you imagine how ugly it would be if he accused you of something and you remained faithful and blameless before everyone? He didn't even dare to hire a private detective because that would also be an insult. He'll keep observing until the end, and eventually he'll figure it all out. Just wait and see. By the way, did you know that Howard used to box in his youth? I don't know, but he would never raise a hand against me, Wendy confidently stated. He wouldn't dare to strike a woman. And what about me? Luther asked. I'm not a woman, and I don't want to walk around with a broken nose or leave my cozy place. That's what I mean, my dear. I think it's time for us to part ways. Wendy looked at Luther with concern, thinking he was joking. But after realizing he wasn't, she shook her head in fear. No, she murmured. You can't leave me like this. We were so good together. I'm sorry, Wendy. But I still remember what it means to count pennies until payday, Luther replied. And I don't want to refresh those memories. You mean a lot to me, of course. But without all this luxury, we simply won't survive. Just think about it. What was it like for you when you were just a regular pharmacist? There must be some way out, Wendy mumbled. Inheritance. Inheritance. If Howard is as strong as an ox, then we have to get rid of him ourselves. We have to kill him. This conversation took place in a separate room of the vacation home, yet Luther still looked around in fear. What are you saying, he exclaimed. What's the big deal? Wendy said as if it were nothing. Just don't tell me you're not tired of always playing second fiddle, like a puppet on a string. All our misfortunes are because of Howard. You know it yourself. Wendy truly believed in her plan. In just one year of married life, she had become so accustomed to wealth that she considered it entirely her own. Howard was an annoying obstacle, a hindrance to her joyful life, and Wendy decided to get rid of him. It took a long time to convince Luther. That was the first time Wendy felt disappointed in Luther. It turned out that he lacked the courage and fighting spirit. 
Luther, as they say, had a weak stomach for such endeavors. Wendy also feared the potential consequences, but the sight of a person who was even more afraid than she was gave her courage. No one will find out anything, she reassured Luther. We'll come up with everything in a way that gives both of us a flawless alibi. And then, after all of this, we'll get married. We'll jointly own the pharmacies. What do you say? And what could Luther say to that? Of course, he also dreamed of more freedom. Even if he couldn't admit it to himself and, as they say, water wears away stone. Eventually, after lengthy persuasion, he agreed. Perhaps Howard was indeed a pushover because Wendy's unexpected suggestion to relax in a countryside house far from the city didn't arouse any suspicion in him. Surprise? Yes, because Wendy never liked such simple getaways. But of course, he couldn't imagine what the catch was. A countryside house, he asked again. Are you sure, Wendy? There's no restaurant there, and there are probably tons of mosquitoes. You yourself told me that you got fed up with that sort of thing back in summer camp when you were a schoolgirl. And now this proposal? But you, on the other hand, love wild getaways, Wendy retorted. I remember how you yourself praised how much fun you had with your friends during your student years. This will be my gift to you. And besides, lately, our relationship has been falling apart. What's true is true, Howard agreed. And still, it's so unexpected. Maybe we should go somewhere you'd like instead? But not Brazil, right? Wendy laughed. We saved that for Christmas. Now let's go into nature. It's settled. On the same day, she began packing her suitcase. Howard was amazed, observing all the commotion, and deep down, he felt that he wasn't particularly happy about what was happening. Of course, Wendy suddenly became the same as she was during their early days of acquaintance, soft, smiling, and feminine. Nevertheless, this behavior seemed somehow nervous and artificial. Howard was afraid to admit it to himself, but it seemed like his wife was gradually losing her mind. The malicious woman who had caused scandals in recent months had suddenly disappeared. However, he could no longer trust Wendy. Something was wrong with all of this. But he couldn't understand what exactly. Howard suddenly recalled a conversation with a friend that had taken place several weeks ago. At that time, he had timidly voiced the thought that his wife was cheating on him. Luther had only laughed in response. Who's cheating? Wendy, he asked. She's an angel, my friend. You're just overworked. That kind of nonsense crosses your mind. You need a break, pal, otherwise, you'll go insane with your work. Do you think I'm exaggerating? Howard asked with doubt. But Wendy has changed so much. She disappears every weekend with some friends, and she barely talks to me anymore. Women's whims, Luther said. Some hormonal imbalance, perhaps? You're a medic, after all. You should know that these things happen. And even though Howard didn't argue with his friend, he couldn't bring himself to believe him. He felt that something was off with his wife, and the unkind glances she sometimes cast his way confirmed it. This trip to the countryside turned out to be strange from the very beginning. Wendy continued to behave nervously, laughing frequently and spouting nonsense. What do you think? Maybe next time we should go camping and relax in those places, she asked her husband. I don't want to go abroad. Let's reminisce about our childhood years, mosquitoes, and mud. It will be more interesting and cost-effective. Plus, it'll be closer for you to commute to work in case of any emergencies. If that was a joke, it was a very poorly executed one, muttered Howard. Wendy, I'm begging you. Let's have a normal conversation. However, his wife constantly evaded serious discussions. First, when they were at the beach, she drifted away from him as far as possible, avoiding answering his questions. Then she struck up a conversation with some single mother who was staying next to them. Howard had never noticed his wife showing an interest in children before. But now, all of a sudden, Wendy started interacting with the child and even initiated some games with them. He was only able to get her alone for a conversation late in the evening when the spouses found themselves in their cottage. Maybe we can finally talk? 
Howard said. Explain to me what's going on. First, you decided to come here with me, although it turns out I'm not really needed. Tears welled up in the girl's eyes. Just like I wasn't needed by you all this time, she sobbed. I need attention. Remember when was the last time you paid attention to me? You're always absorbed in your contracts, bills, and invoices. It never mattered to you where I was or who I was with. But it did matter. Howard objected. You just never wanted to talk about it. You would tell me stories about some mythical friends, but you never even mentioned their names. What was I supposed to do? Interrogate you? Why not? Wendy replied, wiping her nose. If I were important to you, you would do anything to get to the truth. Howard hesitated for a long time before asking the next question. Finding out the answer suddenly became terrifying. Do you have someone else, he inquired? What does it matter? Wendy wearily asked. She got up and headed towards the door. Don't follow me, she warned her husband. I want to take a walk along the shore alone. Confused by her words, Howard watched as she left the house. For a while, he stood there, stunned. Then he went in search of his wife. He simply couldn't leave everything as it was. Everything had to be resolved that evening. The countryside cottages in that area were not the most popular. They were remnants from previous generations, quietly living out their days. Besides, it was a cool summer. Therefore, there weren't many vacationers around. Howard walked along dimly lit paths, lacking proper streetlights, and looked around. Then he descended to the water. Wendy, he called out softly. The beach was empty. Feeling like a complete fool, Howard walked along the shore. The thought that his wife had brought him here, said she would go to the beach, and was actually visiting her new friend and her son didn't leave him. She was probably drinking tea and laughing at her clueless husband. Did she really have a lover or not? Wendy never answered that question. The shore was rocky, and the water crashed against the pebbles, making a noise. Howard heard footsteps. Before he could turn around, he received a strong blow to the back of his head and fell face first onto the rocks. He didn't remember anything else after that. Howard woke up in a modest countryside cottage, amidst the murmuring of a somewhat disgruntled guy and a young girl. At first, he only noticed that the stranger had an almost angelic appearance. A face without a gram of makeup, huge blue eyes. It was only after a few days that Howard realized Annabelle truly was an angel, the person who had saved his life. The girl became quite flustered when Howard kissed her hand. Blushing, she immediately began arguing with him, claiming that her actions were completely ordinary and anyone in her place would have done the same. Howard disagreed with Annabelle. He had only spent one year with Wendy to understand that not every girl would risk their life to come to someone's aid, especially when there was no large sum of money waiting for them as a reward. Trying to hide her embarrassment, Annabelle changed the subject. You mentioned that you're starting to remember something, Annabelle remarked. Maybe you remember the phone number of one of your relatives or can provide their address. That way, we can let them know where you are. You didn't have a phone on you, so I didn't know how to reach them. I remember the phone number, but I won't contact her," Howard replied darkly. She'll come, finish the job. Now he finally understood that Wendy was the one who attacked him. It didn't matter what the reason was. Her insanity, her love for money, or her desire to conceal her lover. Whoever he was. No random person could have ended up where Howard was vacationing with Wendy. No robber would come up with such a complex plan. Tracking down their victim hundreds of kilometers away from the city, going for murder just to get a cheap mobile phone, and then disposing of the body somewhere in the dense woods using an expensive car. Howard couldn't comprehend one thing. How did Wendy have the strength for all of this? He was a fairly large man, and his wife never went to the gym. Her figure was typical for a model, with thin arms like matchsticks. There was no way she could have dragged him anywhere by herself unless someone helped her. That very lover whose name she kept hidden. Apparently, Howard had been sitting like this for too long, lost in thought, because Annabelle started to worry. 
Are you sure you're okay? She asked. Maybe it's better for you to lie down? I've been lying down enough. Howard retorted. It's time to do something. Annabelle looked at him and bit her lip. The phrase he had uttered recently wouldn't leave her alone. You said someone will try to kill you again, she said. Who were you talking about? My wife, Howard grimly replied. Or rather, my ex-wife. It was long overdue for us to get divorced. Now I think it's truly a sign from above. I shouldn't give her a second chance, right? The word wife somehow hurt Annabelle. The girl herself didn't know why it upset her. After all, she had seen the engagement ring on Howard's finger before. Yet, it's one thing to suspect and another to be certain about everything. As if reading her thoughts, Howard looked at his hand. He took off the ring and threw it out of the open window, right into the raspberry bushes. Annabelle suddenly thought that with Vince's next job in the garden, he would have a good harvest. He would be quite surprised by the golden find in his raspberry bush. Annabelle wanted to clarify something. According to Howard, who could that blonde guy be? But she didn't get a chance to ask as Mrs. Floreso arrived with her homemade broth, and the conversation had to be postponed. As soon as she left, Vince appeared at the doorstep. He looked even gloomier than usual and very angry. It's time to go, he said to Howard. Get ready. I'll take you to the hospital. Annabelle looked at him in fear. Vince. What are you doing? You said Howard needed a few more days to rest. He can rest there. I assure you, the hospital beds are no worse than my couch. Maybe even more luxurious. Besides, it's getting cramped here with the three of us. The girl shifted her gaze from Howard to Vince and back again, then ushered the latter out the door. Vince. What's going on, she whispered. What's gotten into you? Everything was fine this morning, right? It wasn't, the paramedic stubbornly replied. Nothing is fine. You just stubbornly refused to notice. And about what got into me, Goldie dropped by. She told me what you've been up to here. Goldie. So she couldn't keep her mouth shut? Despite Annabelle's pleas. On the other hand, what else could one expect from an offended woman who also happened to be your ex-girlfriend? And what is it? Annabelle asked, surprised. Enlighten me because I have no idea. What special thing have we been doing here that made you come home like this? He was kissing your hand, Vince replied in a tragic tone. Goldie saw it herself. And what's that called? That's called human gratitude, Annabelle replied. Howard finally found out that I saved him. That I tracked down the criminal and so on. He was really impressed with my actions. Perhaps a bit too much, I must say. So he expressed his gratitude as best as he could. Hmm. Vince nodded. If this guy expresses his gratitude like this when he can barely stand on his own two feet, what will happen when he recovers? Will he throw himself at you with kisses right here on my couch? Annabelle listened to all of this, unable to believe her ears. What are you saying, Vince? It's not like you at all. I never would have thought you would stoop so low. Slandering a sick person, let alone our guest. Forgive me, Vince mumbled. I just see how he looks at you. First, he takes my couch, and now he wants to take my place in your life. Do you think I can calmly watch as he takes you away? All of this is complete nonsense, the girl muttered. Though her heart was pounding with excitement. Vince said that Howard was looking at her in a special way. And what if he was right? Annabelle didn't know how to feel about this message. She couldn't understand if it pleased or upset her. I'll take him to the hospital, Vince repeated. It'll be better for all of us. Don't forget that some criminals might be following this guy's tracks. Who knows? Maybe they went back to the forest and found no one there. I think they might have questions. Where did the body go? Or they might suspect that the dead man came back to life and walked away. Let's ask Howard himself, Annabelle reluctantly replied. Let him decide. That's how it'll be. Sorry. 
I completely forgot that I'm no longer the owner of this house. And my own patience, Vince replied bitterly. They returned to the house and were surprised to see that Howard was already on his feet, though leaning on the table. I'm ready, doctor, Howard said. We can go now if you command. Annabelle rushed to him and said anxiously, what are you saying? You're still not well. And why go at night? Wait at least until morning. Howard pushed her away and replied sadly, you're right. It'll be better that way. I've been here for too long. Without saying a word, Vince headed to the car, and Howard whispered to the girl, this house has very poor sound insulation. So, I heard your conversation with that guy perfectly. The third person here is truly unnecessary. It's time for me to go. He gently freed his sleeve, which Annabelle was holding onto, and walked out into the yard. Annabelle followed him. Please let us know when you recover, she shouted. Or no, what am I saying? Call us as soon as you can. We'll be waiting for news from you. Vince, who was already in the driver's seat, didn't comment on her words. Who? Him, certainly, wasn't eager to receive any messages from his rival. Howard nodded and waved his hand. The car had already disappeared from sight when Annabelle realized that she hadn't given him her number. All his promises were just empty words. Most likely, they had parted ways forever. Lost and wandering around the room, tidying up after the patient, Annabelle then began to pack her things, which had accumulated quite a bit during the time she had been taking care of Howard. She even brought her stuffed rabbit, with whom Annabelle was used to sleeping at home, here. With the rabbit in her arms and a small bag that couldn't fit the rabbit, the girl went out to meet Vince. He had returned when it was already dark and sadly smiled when he noticed her. You're still here. How could I leave without knowing how it all ended? Annabelle replied. Did you take Howard to the hospital? Did everything go well? Vince ignored her question. He was looking at Annabelle's bag. You know what I'll miss, he asked. You in this house. It seems like I've gotten used to having you around all the time. Did you safely take Howard? Annabelle asked again, raising her voice. Yeah, I did, Vince nodded. But not to the hospital. He asked to be dropped off on the outskirts of the city. He stayed in some yard on a bench. And you just left a sick person at the mercy of fate like that? Annabelle exclaimed. Vince. This is not like you. You've said something similar today already, the guy remarked. But how could you abandon someone who needed help? Vince. You're a doctor. You're supposed to treat people, care for them. What could I have done? Vince snapped. Fight with him? It was his choice, and I don't want to violate someone's will with my own desires. Besides, I wasn't really keen on driving him around the whole city. I'm sick and tired of this whole story. It will haunt me at night. Annabelle put the bag on the porch and firmly declared, we will go and pick up Howard from the place where you left him. Immediately. Vince looked at her with surprise. Wow, such a tone. And what if I refuse? Then, then I'll go find him myself. On foot if necessary, Annabelle helplessly replied. Or I'll go to the highway and flag down a car. So that they find you later with a head injury? Vince remarked. Get in already, let's go. Annabelle walked towards the car, fearing that he might change his mind. Vince got behind the wheel and glanced sideways at the stuffed rabbit. You know? Sometimes I think that you liked this guy precisely because he was so sickly and pathetic. Like this toy. From pity to love, just one step. Am I right? Don't talk nonsense, Annabelle muttered. Let's go faster already. Maybe we'll still find Howard. He's unlikely to wait for us for a whole hour, but let's try, Vince replied. Annabelle was worried that Howard might not be there after all. Who knows what dangers could await him on the nighttime streets, perhaps more than in the forest at night. At least, in the forest, Annabelle had never encountered criminals and bandits. Meanwhile, Howard managed to encounter both a killer and a wife who wished him dead. 
quite the set. To her relief, Howard was found exactly where Vince had left him, lying on his back and gazing at the night sky. Annabelle immediately rushed to him. What's wrong with you, Howard? Are you feeling unwell? And again, this question, the man smiled. Now that you're here, I can say for sure that I feel good. Vince approached them and frowned at his patient. What are you trying to achieve with this, he asked. Do you want to get pneumonia in addition to a concussion? You should know that the nights are cold now. I was just thinking about what to do next. Where to go? Howard replied. And it seems like I've figured it out. Where to? Annabelle asked excitedly. To my friend Luther. If my own home is currently close to me, I'll try to weather the storm at a friend's place. In the worst case, I'll find out what's going on. What people are saying about my disappearance and everything else. Annabelle glanced at Vince. Will you take him, Vince? Of course, I'll take him. I do taxi driving at night, remember? Vince replied sarcastically. Ignoring his sarcasm, Annabelle dragged Howard towards the car. Tell me the address, she said, giving Vince a warning look. Luther lived in the city center, in one of the skyscrapers. From its windows, one could oversee the entire city. It seemed like he wanted to rise above everyone, both literally and metaphorically, to seek revenge on life for past failures. Pretty fancy place, Vince remarked, surveying the street they were passing. Annabelle, what do you think? Can we afford a storage room in this area by the time we're 70, or should we not even hope? The girl let his words pass her ears. Something was troubling her, but she couldn't even say to herself what exactly it was. How long have you known your friend, she asked Howard. We've known each other since college. Although he didn't study at the medical college. He enrolled in economics, but we met at a student gathering. And then we complimented each other well in business, Howard replied. And in your opinion, is he a good person? Annabelle persisted. A strange question, Vince muttered. They're friends, after all. Howard unexpectedly frowned for everyone. You know? I can't say that Luther is a bad person. But lately, there's been some kind of looseness about him. He's been performing worse at work, being careless with his affairs. He's lost in his own thoughts. And we haven't had a heart-to-heart -heart talk in a long time. It's like there's never enough time. In life, everything comes at a cost, Vince said in a didactic tone. We've achieved a lot in life, but lost friends in return. Howard let out a heavy sigh. Maybe you're right. When I didn't have a business, everything seemed simpler. Truly, was it? And now, you just can't understand. Where are friends? Where are enemies? It's all too confusing. They approached the entrance. Vince hesitantly suggested, well, should we say our goodbyes? I'll go with Howard, Annabelle declared. The men looked at her in surprise. Why? Vince didn't understand. Are you planning to take care of him forever? Snap out of it, Annabelle. Howard is already with his friends. Everything will be fine. But I want to see what kind of friends he has, the girl stubbornly said. Then I'll go with you, Vince muttered. Although, honestly, it's just ridiculous, Annabelle. I don't understand you at all. The girl herself wanted to understand what seemed suspicious to her. After what Howard had told her about his wife, Annabelle was ready to be suspicious of all his acquaintances. Moreover, the person in the forest who attacked Howard was not a woman at all. Howard pressed the doorbell and waited. His friend responded almost immediately. Who's there? It's me, Howard. Luther, sorry for coming so late. Will you let us in? His friend remained silent for so long that all three of them thought there was no one on the other side. Yes, of course. Come in, he finally muttered. He's a strange one, Vince said when they entered the entrance. They ascended to the seventh floor in grave silence. And when the elevator doors opened, Luther was already waiting for them at the threshold. His face turned pale at the sight of his friend. 
Howard. So, it's really you, he muttered. Luther didn't show any particular joy at his friend's visit. Of course, Howard replied. Why shouldn't I drop by? Didn't we used to do this in the past? No, we were just saying that you disappeared without a trace, Luther replied. Wendy called me. Annabelle nudged Vince with her elbow and whispered in horror, it's him. Who, the guy didn't understand. The person from the forest who wanted to kill Howard. They entered the apartment and closed the door behind them. Vince clenched his suitcase to his chest, which he habitually brought into the apartment. Howard, unaware of anything, carried on. So, Wendy called, huh, he asked. And what did she say? Did she tell you how she was hunting me down with a brick in her hand? I definitely didn't expect that from her. And honestly, not from anyone else either. Luther remained silent. Unable to contain herself, Annabelle shouted, Howard. It's him. He brought you to the forest. This friend of yours. I'm sure of it. Howard looked at her in astonishment. Suddenly, Luther's voice broke through. What nonsense are you spouting? Luther snapped. What forest are you talking about? Were you there to see it all? Vince immediately caught him on his words. So, there was something to see there after all? Vince inquired. Well, it's all clear now. Howard, I think it's time to call the police or should we interrogate this guy ourselves first? Howard looked at Luther. Was it really you? And was Wendy the lover whose name I couldn't figure out? Luther struggled to find his words. Vince slowly reached for the clasps of his suitcase. Well, we'll find out now, Vince said. I have something here. In small doses, it works like alcohol or drugs. It'll loosen Luther's tongue. And if we overdo it a bit. We can tell the police we found him in that state. Overdoses happen often. He took out a syringe and a vial from his suitcase, and Luther shook his head fearfully. Howard. You're not going to do this, are you? It's a criminal offense. You'll never forgive yourself for it. And have you forgiven yourself for attacking me? Howard asked, nodding at Vince. Go ahead, Vince. Do what you think is necessary. In the end, Luther told them everything. About Wendy's plan and his involvement in it. Later, he repeated it all to the police. Luther and Wendy were arrested. They now face a significant prison sentence, while Vince and Annabelle return to the village. They tried to live as they did before, but it didn't work out for them. Sorry, but I think I don't love you, the girl said once, pushing away from the boy when he tried to kiss her. Vince, you're a good person, but you're just a friend to me. Vince smirked sadly. Yes, I've figured it out. That beaten up man is better for you than me. Is that right? It's not about him, Annabelle shook her head. I've just realized a lot during this time. We are very different, you and I. I love the forest, while you're drawn to the city. I'm too ordinary for you. You need someone as vibrant as you. Like who? Vince asked. Goldie, the girl answered with a smile. Can't you see it? She's been pining for you since the day you arrived here. Goldie. Goldie, the guy muttered. You girls are experts at arranging each other's love lives. Well, I won't dwell on it for now. It's time for me to work. And still, take a closer look at her, Annabelle shouted after him. She's wonderful. You'll make a great couple. I'm sure of it. Vince waved his hand at her. It seemed he wasn't really angry with Annabelle. Perhaps he had expected something like this ever since the girl told him about the wounded stranger in the forest. Annabelle went home, pondering how strange life is. Everyone predicted that Vince would be her husband, but she had always felt from the beginning that they weren't a match. Then who was her other half? Where could she find them? Despite what Vince might think, many days had passed, and there was no news from Howard. Lost in her thoughts, she almost crashed into a huge jeep parked near her house. Howard stepped out of the car with a smile and handed her a bouquet of lilies. 
Good day. This is for you, Annabelle. A slightly belated gift for saving me. I promised to let you know how things were going with me. I didn't take your phone number, so I came here in person. I hope you're not upset with me for being so forward. I'm upset that I waited for you for so long, Annabelle replied and threw herself into his arms. The forgotten bouquet fell to the ground. There was no longer any meaning in flowers or confessions. Howard and Annabelle were finally together and would never part again.